Good morning, everyone. Let's go ahead and call the uh, March 15th, 2018 meeting of the Cannabis Advisory Committee to order. Uh, can we have a uh, roll call, please? Bobolian? Present. Sir Mack? Here. Clifford? Here. Dombrowski? Here. Farrow? Here. Heidelbeck Terramoto? Here. Harada? Here. Huffman? Here. Jacobson? Here. Leff? Lynch? Nevidal? Here. Nikita? Peck? Here. Ron? Here. Stevenson? Here. Sweeney? Here. Todd? Here. Williams? Woolsey? Here. Wu? Here. You? Quorum is established. All right, thank you. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the meeting. Uh, we have uh, welcome opening remarks by our Director of uh, Department of Consumer Affairs, Mr. Dean Grafilo. Morning. Morning, Chair Ron, committee members. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to provide a few opening remarks. As the director of the Department of Consumer Affairs, my role is to provide support to the Bureau as they continue to work long hours to implement, license, and enforce the will of the people of California. The role that you all serve on a voluntary basis is absolutely critical to the Bureau and the other licensing entities and their, and, and their success. Each and every one of you has been dedicated to providing input and participating to the full extent asked of you and even beyond. The value that you bring cannot be overstated, as you each provide a unique perspective on the licensing structure and the different parties impacted, from consumers to growers, to distributors and transporters, laboratories, and everything in between. I encourage you all to continue to provide the valuable feedback that you have been doing and look forward to working with all of you. I now turn the microphone over to Ms. Lori Ajax, Chief of the Bureau of Cannabis Control, who also has been and continues to work very hard to appropriately implement the law. Thank you very much. Good morning, I'm Lori Ajax with the Bureau of Cannabis Control and thank you all for being here today. I won't take too long because I know we have a lot of work to get through, but I first wanted to just uh, Thank all of you for being here today. Um, I'm always very impressed with the turnout we have to these events. And uh, you, know, you know, here in LA, we love coming to LA because there's always such a great turnout. We know you're very busy taking time off to come here. Just wanted you to know we appreciate you being here. We think it's important that we hear from all stakeholders and really appreciate the time that you've spent telling us your story, telling us what's affecting you, and helping us shape uh, this cannabis regulation. And we look forward to continue working with you today and throughout this process. I also want to thank the committee members. I know there's been a lot to do in a very short amount of time, and I just appreciate all the hard work you've done, especially with these subcommittees. There was a lot of information coming at you, a lot to get through, and um, we really appreciate it, and we're looking forward to what comes out of today. And knowing that we have a lot of recommendations on the table, I'm going to stop talking and let uh, Chair Ron get going. So onward, thank you for being here, and let's get this done. Thanks. All right. Well, first up on our agenda is a revo review and approval for the uh, January 18 uh, committee meeting minutes. I need a... I move approval of the minutes. Second. All right. I have a motion and a second. Do we have any public comment on our minutes from January 18th? Seeing none, we'll just move why not right on. Take a roll call on that. Bobolian? Aye. Sir Mack? Aye. Clifford? Aye. Dombrowski? Aye. Farrow? Aye. Heidelbeck Terramoto? Aye. Harada? Aye. Huffman? Aye. Jacobson? Aye. Nevidal? Aye. Sorry. Leff? Lynch? Nikita? Aye. Peck? Aye. Ron? Aye. Stevenson? Aye. Sweeney? Aye. Todd? Aye. Williams? Woolsey? Aye. Wu? Aye. You? Aye. The minutes pass. All right, thank you. All right, um, 
we're, we're going to take things just slightly out of order this morning, and we're going to take item number 13 as our first uh, discussion this morning, only because the uh, chair has to leave a little bit early today, so I wanted to allow her an opportunity to uh, uh, talk uh, a little bit more thoroughly and answer any questions that might come up on the uh, discussion and possible action to approve, modify, or reject subcommittee on testing laboratories recommendations. Um, how, how I think we should uh, handle this today is first to get just sort of a brief uh, report from the committee chair, or subcommittee chair, on, uh, on you know, how things went, and brief being, you know, let's not go through each one of the items, but just let's, uh, you know, get your, uh, get your impression of how things went, and, and, um, and uh, then what, for in interest of time, we'll, we'll sort of move through this one, but make recommendation on um, sort of parsing out between regulatory and non-regulatory recommendations, and I'll get to that in just a moment. But if we could have a, a quick um, quick summary from Ms. Uh, Jacobson, that'd be great. Oh, and you have to hold down your buttons. I don't, but everybody else apparently has to hold their button down to keep speaking, so okay. just so you know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so we were, we only had the chance to meet once as a subcommittee, and during that meeting, um, we did get a lot of public comment on the recommendations that uh, we will be making um, to the board, to the advisory committee to make to the BCC. Um, the first one is testing for research and development. The recommendation is that regulations should allow for licensed laboratories to accept materials from any licensed entity that is part of the supply chain for research and development without a requirement to report the results. And this is because during the process of R&D, we think that manufacturers and cultivators should be allowed to test their products um, to make them the best quality that they can. In the, uh, in section 26100 subdivision K, the business and professions code does not prohibit a licensee from performing testing on a licensee's premises for the purposes of quality assurance, but our recommendation really is that the testing not necessarily be performed on the licensee's premises, but at the licensed laboratory. So um, at this point, shall I move to make this recommendation? No, let's just go through uh, quickly your uh, list of recommendations and then we'll make a recommendation there. Um, the second one was just to clarify that the regulations um, explicitly state that the testing results are valid on a finished manufactured cannabis product until the expiration date of that product as determined by the manufacturer. And the expiration date determined by the manufacturer should be supported by in-house or third-party data. And this came up because there was some, cu some confusion as to how long the testing results would be valid. The staff comments from BCC are that this would not be in conflict with any provisions in the act. The third was to, um, for the Bureau to incorporate standard testing analytical methodology in the final regulations. And this is a really critical issue because what we're trying to do is make sure that all licensed laboratories come up with the same result when testing products. And without a set of standard testing analytical methodology, um, there will be too much variation from lab to lab. We understand that there currently is no set methodology in place for the testing of cannabis, however, there are um, programs and standards that have been set up in different states and different countries that meet this requirement. And um, we recommend that the BCC look at those standards and also um, the USP to set up those standards to ensure that testing at every lab is valid. Based on the staff comments from the BCC, I have a further, recommend, a further specification to this recommendation, um, which is to require, at the very least, um, that the same reference standards be used by all licensed laboratories. 
And then we were running out of time during our meeting and there were um, some concerns about waste disposal from laboratories. And so our recommendation is that the Bureau should revisit cannabis waste disposal from testing laboratories. Um, issues related to cannabis waste are outlined in sections 5054 and 5055. Um, but there were some public concerns about waste requirements that specifically apply to testing labs only that the BCC should consider. And since we didn't have time to uh, further discuss that, we did want to put that on as a recommendation. So, do you also want me to go to, through the recommendations that require statutory changes? Sure, let's hit that one real quick. <clears throat> this recommendation is that any adult may have a cannabis product tested at a licensed testing lab. And currently in the act, um, anyone with a medical card or a, medic a recommendation by a physician may, that, that individual or, or caregiver of that individual may go to a licensed testing facility and have any product tested, but adults who don't have a medical card are excluded from that provision. And so we strongly recommend that um, that's revisited even though it requires a statutory, rec uh, statutory change. Okay, thank you. So, so for each one of these sections uh, today, we have regulatory recommendations and we have statutory recommendations. And, and uh, you know, in, in discussion with uh, uh, BCC staff, I think the, I, the idea here and what the subcommittees were, were, you know, supposed to focus on were the regulatory issues. Um, now, not to say that the conversations weren't robust and useful when we're talking about, you know, the... Uh, um, statutory changes, but the thought here is, you know, that, that given the charge of what the subcommittees were supposed to accomplish, uh, you all did a fantastic job there. However, the statutory recommendations, uh, we'd like to sort of pull those off to the side um, in each one of these sections and say, look, that's, uh, um, let's go ahead and put those into a staff, or a report to staff uh, that they can use and, and actually have on file. Um, because otherwise, you know, what we're doing, we're, we don't have any authority to, you know, influence or, or change the, the, um, the legislation on this or a statutory uh, language. And so rather than get caught, because we have a lot of information and conversation that needs to happen today, so rather than get caught in the uh, focusing on the statutory changes, we, we focus all our attention today on regulatory um, so I just wanted to get a consensus from the uh, committee this morning that we're okay to sort of pull out of each of these sections the statutory uh, recommendations and put them into a report, um, but focus today our, our efforts on regulatory. Mr. Chairman? Yes. A question. Sure. Are you suggesting that the regulatory, the ones that require statute just be parked and nothing happened to them? No, not not nothing happened, but you know they're they're on they're part of the record. They're part of the recommendation that goes back to uh, the BCC. Um, but you know it's not part of our uh, uh, broader discussion today because our focus was intended to be on the regulatory piece. I have a, a, a follow-up. Um, wouldn't it uh, give a little bit more emphasis uh, and and uh, direction to the staff if we were to vote on those today? Oh, oh, yeah. No, I think we will. I mean, you know, so we will take each one of those as more or less, uh, for lack of a better word, a consent item, right? So, you know, I think the uh, subcommittees had a much closer look at each one of these topic areas, made those recommendations. I think the recommendations are, are useful uh, for the BCC, but rather than, you know, get caught up in a, you know, broader discussion on statutory issues, we, we focus a little bit more closely on the regulatory side, which is what our charge was, but make sure that all of those statutory recommendations uh, make their way into a report to the uh, BCC. I, let me just ask a quick question, if I can. Um, 
I guess the question to me is whether the statutory recommendations are going to be something that's going to have the weight of a recommendation of the entire advisory committee. So eventually there are going to be, you know, there is going to be legislation to make changes to obviously many issues are going to come up. And to me it does seem fairly powerful on the legislative level to say, you know, this advisory committee looked at it and the advisory committee made this recommendation. Um, the BCC correctly said they don't have authority to do that. It requires a statutory change, and then ma that makes its way in some form to the legislature. But are we going to be as a committee, when you say there'll be consent items, not everyone on the committee might agree with each of the recommendations that involve a statutory change. So are we going to be voting to adopt those as a committee? I mean, yes. Okay. Um, another, just another possibility would be maybe to, since we have subsequent meeting. The, there's more time urgency mm -hmm. on the regulatory recommendations to get the regulations out. We could potentially at our subsequent meeting discuss and vote on things that require a statutory change because that won't, isn't as um, imminent. Right. But, it, it, but, if they are, but if we are voting and they have the weight of a, of a recommendation from the full advisory committee, whether it happens now or later, I'm fine with it. Um, but I, I do think that given the subcommittee work, that should be considered and, and voted on by the full advisory committee. I agree. Um, and, and if anybody has particular heartburn or, or concern or, or angst over um, you know, a particular recommendation uh, that, that has that sort of legislative directive, um, what we could do at the end of today's meeting, we have uh, item number 15 is future agenda items. So. You know, rather than you know deal with it uh, today and for time efficiency, um, you know pull an item uh, or make the recommendation. You know that that item get discussed at a future meeting. Um, because again, if we bring this back and say there's 47 items for a legislative uh, uh, conversation, that's going to take you know more time than we have in any one meeting. So and and I don't think necessarily looking across the list myself personally and. And maybe some of you would agree that that we don't necessarily need that robust discussion on everything on the legislative side. So let that move forward. And if you have something of, of concern or, or issue on on the legislative side that that you don't think has been addressed adequately, or you have some concerns over, or something that may not have been addressed at all, let's wait until item number 15 today, and you can make that recommendation. And we'll put it on the agenda. Yeah, I would support something like that because we have a lot of work to do today and we should focus on the things that we can control and legislative issues while they might be worthy of discussion. Uh, I don't know if they're worthy of discussion today given the volume of things that we really do need to get through focusing on regulations. So maybe push the uh, statutory items to a further date. Sure. Okay, so I would, I would entertain a motion from, from our uh, uh, colleagues here. Um, to uh, move, you know, sort of approval of recommendation for all uh, statutory items in today's agenda um, and, uh, uh, and focus on uh, regulatory for the remainder. So moved. We have a second? Second. All right. Any uh, public comment? on that. that Can I correct? ask a question before we go to public yes. comment? So would these statutory items come up on our next agenda in Fresno so we would address them in two months? Uh, not, not necessarily. I think we can discuss that at the end of the meeting um, on, uh, on the uh, future agenda items um, and see if there's particular ones that we need to address. Otherwise this all gets lumped into one report and recommendation by the committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes ma'am. Uh, I. I don't have a problem with the motion, but I do have a problem with your response because I think we ought to have uh, an agenda item to go through the statutory because uh, a lot of the work of the committees is statutory. And if we aren't dealing with them with any substance, then, I mean, there's, there's no point. And then there's also a timeline for legislation that we have to take under consideration for the department if we want to recommend some things. So, I would just like to ask that you say yes, we'll be on some specific agenda so we can look forward to discussing them. Okay. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I am really concerned that they would just sit and we wouldn't get to them until potentially after legislation is at a phase where they are a moot point. Sure. Okay, so let's... Two things, let's Mr. Chair, two things. One is that I heard in your, in your motion approval of the the recommendations and I'm curious as to whether or not you meant that the committee as a whole is approving of those recommendations well that's the idea yes and the second thing that I want to mention uh, 
is that under the overview, I just want to establish that we have, uh, this committee has the right to rec make recommendations about standards and regulations, including best practices and, uh, and guidelines. So these uh, statutory recommendations are wholly within the purview of our committee, although the Bureau itself does not have the right to advocate legislation. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Any Great. other? Just, can I, I'm sorry, but can yes. there just be clarity? Like, if we vote yes on this motion, are we approving all the statutory recommendations by the subcommittees as recommendations from the entire advisory board, or are we, rec are we voting to table them to be discussed at the next meeting? I'm not clear about, like, whether my vote is to approve those recommendations as the whole body or not. Yeah, so why don't we restate the motion, uh, if you wouldn't mind, Mr. Wolseley. Sure, yeah, I'd move that they be tabled. Statutory uh, recommendations that need, would need to be changed by statute or that address an issue in statute, those should be tabled to a future meeting. That's my, my motion. Okay. And do we have a second? I'll second the motion. And last, last name. When you make a motion and a second, if you could just say your last name for our... Uh, no Mem takers here, that'd be great. I'll second the motion, Member Harada. All right. Any other uh, question or discussion among members? All right, seeing none, we will go ahead and open it for public comment. Um, uh, oh, go ahead, yes. Hi, my name is Rebecca Nicholas, and I'm going to be facilitating the public comment today. You all um, see that we have a very long agenda. I have a little timer here. Um, we have a speaker's table, so if you'd like to make a public comment on this agenda item. If you could just queue up down the center aisle, there's some little blue X's. Um, and then if you could keep your comments to a minute, 30 seconds, please. Um, again, the timer will, will keep you on track. Um, we do have a court reporter here today. She's taking record of today's meeting. You do not have to state your name for the record, but if you could please speak as slowly and clearly as possible, that'll be helpful to her. And just as a reminder, we're um, live webcasting today's meeting as well. So with that, let's please begin. Oh, and, and real quick, so we have three seats up there. So oh, folks yeah. in the queue, go ahead and grab a chair. And then as the chair opens up, if we get multiple people, then we'll just run through it that way. And Thank you. also just in the interest of time, I would just ask that um, each individual speak once on each motion and agenda item. So with that, we'll begin. Okay, Paul. Hi, my name is Paul Hansbury, lovingly and legally out of Mendocino County. Um, some of the issues I reviewed, some of these comments, and some of them are statutory, or that was the response anyway. Um, I take issue with uh, at least one of them, that the, it's the interpretation of, uh, for instance, on page uh, four and five of the document that I uh, put out for you. Um, the interpretation is strict and literal about uh, premises and contiguous. However, and, and what, I, what we proposed was an accessory license. Each premises would have a, a single license. It would be an accessory to a micro business. There, across the, the state, there are different jurisdictions that have zoning regulations where they would not allow manufacturing whatsoever unless it's industrial. And they wouldn't allow uh, cultivation unless it was ag. So, Having these accessory licenses would be one license, which would be a micro business, but instead of the premises would be defined as um, ownership rather than by the parcel. So it has to do more with the interpretation of, instead of being strict and literal, interpreting the, the language a little bit differently so that it would give a, a, take away one of the barriers for micro business, which could be the salvation for the small farmer. Uh, having, having a micro business, especially in rural areas in our part of the world. So interpreting it as a, um, as a ownership instead of a parcel would be helpful. Thank you, Paul. And just a reminder that we do have micro business as another agenda item today, so there will be an opportunity to discuss that in more detail. So. They said that the, the fix was statutory. And if you're yeah, it, perfect. Okay. My name is Lindsay Comey, and I'm with Operation EVAC and Weed for Warriors, and I'm also a member of the California Compassion Coalition. And many of the items that are being tabled are about a health crisis of compassionate care. 
So when I listen to this panel say, you know, we can put it off for Fresno. I'm dealing with patients that are in pain that are not able to get their medications because this bureau has put a stranglehold on donations and compassion. So those statutory moments are what you are here for to deal with a crisis of legalization. So I want you to think seriously about that. I'm simply saying many of the statutory stuff is really based on how to manage this public health crisis. So by putting it off for a couple of months, you are doing the war on compassion. And I have to tell my patients again, you know, I'm sorry, they decided it was a, an issue they couldn't handle and had to put it off for a couple of months. I don't think that's the response they want from this bureau. Thanks very much. Hi, go ahead. Good morning, Susan Tibbin, Lovingly and Legally, Mendocino County. Uh, to echo the previous speaker, um, I'd like to mention uh, another sort of crisis, not to belabor the point, but we are still just slightly over 1% adoption in relation to projected metrics, both for the Mendocino County and the state. And much of what is going to be tabled um, is, it has to be examined more closely because otherwise we're looking at promoting the black market and we are fast losing most of our medical, mirroring Colorado that has lost 90% of it. So I ask you respectfully, um, we, we appreciate all the work you are doing, but we too are working hard to drive adoption and we cannot do that if salient, very, very important issues are tabled for who knows how long. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Yeah. All right, next up. Uh, Ross Gordon, I'm policy coordinator with California Growers Association. Uh, we represent about 1,300 members uh, statewide, largely small and independent cannabis businesses. Um, largely agree with the comments uh, prior uh, to this. Um, we are very, very concerned about, uh, about small growers' ability to enter the regulated market. Um, and uh, the current situation is a crisis, and so we hope that um, you all take your, your mandate seriously for that reason. Um, I have two specific recommendations on uh, this particular point. Um, the first is uh, that our members have had concerns. Um, we do appreciate your work, but we, we've had some concerns about the transparency of this committee. Um, for instance, the subcommittee recommendations being uh, put forward and made available to the public about 36 hours ago has not been enough time for, for us or for probably other members of the public to really deliberate on those, those recommendations. So in the spirit of sort of improving that going forward, um, would ask that anything that you do decide to table, um, that that be made very clearly available to the public um, very quickly and that there be a uh, broad public comment solicited on those items. Um, the second thing uh, we would recommend is, and, and this has been sort of referenced by the other speakers, um, is that any, uh, it, that the committee today should consider um, identifying priority statutory recommendations. Not every single statutory recommendation maybe needs to be discussed today. But I think compassion is a great example of something. Every single committee, I believe, discussed this issue. It is clearly a, a major crisis issue in the system right now, and that is worth voting on today, I think. Thank you. Thanks, Russ. <laughs> All right, next up. Uh, Ron Edwards, Willits. I'm representing a number of small nurseries here today. Um, I think a lot of the things we're talking about, particularly when it comes to nurseries and cultivation, are time sensitive. Um, we're getting ready to go into cultivation issue, um, dealing with the A and the M, and if we put these off, we are now further into the cultivation season. Uh, we're dealing with a perishable product when it's going in the ground, particularly with the nursery. So I think a lot of the issues are statutory, and we need to get those in front of the legislators so that we can get those addressed. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Um, okay. Seeing no other public comment, I'll turn it. Oh. Uh, can I just ask that if you have a public comment, if you could queue up just in the interest of time. Come on up. Certainly. My apologies. Uh, Max Magalotes with K Street Consulting um, would suggest a substitute motion on this issue, which would be to move to go and uh, table these items until the next meeting rather than table them for a future meeting um, to ensure that they do get taken up at the meeting in Fresno. That's my only comment. Thank you so much. Thanks, Max. Uh, oh. Thought. No worries. Not going to cry. All right. Okay, Chair. I'll turn it back to you. All right. Um, any, any further discussion, colleagues? I, I would, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I would like us, um, perhaps after the motion, to clarify uh, 
what we mean by statutory and who has the prerogative and the timelines. I think there might be a little confusion that we should try to straighten out before we go forward. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sweeney? Uh, yes. Uh, f first of all, I, I think it is an uh, excellent idea, uh, although I, it is obviously more work, but it is an excellent idea to talk about what are the priority statutes uh, so that at least we have a laser focus on that part um, that is uh, pertinent to the entire body. Um, and uh, I, compassion is one of those as an example. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Mr. Chairman, yes. if, if Mr. Okay. Woosley could possibly uh, identify what meeting we would be taking up the statutory issues, because I think if, if we said at this specific meeting we'll be addressing this, it gives everybody um, time, and we know that, in fact, we are going to do it. So. Yeah, I was going to leave that for agenda item 15, which is, or I think it's 15 which is setting the agenda for the next meeting. Okay. And then I, I think I blew it. The, the next meeting is in Oakland, not Fresno. It's, so I apologize for that. And I do have just one comment, uh, a reminder that 26014, the Business and Professions Code, uh, talks about the advisory committee is here to advise the licensing authorities. Uh, it says nothing in here about advising the legislature. So while these are important issues, uh, this forum should be on advising the licensing authorities on what they do have purview to change. Okay. Okay, and I think, you know, just, just for a point of clarification, I think the, uh, uh, again, uh, Mr. Wolsey, I, I, I agree we're here to uh, discuss the regulatory side. I, I agree with, uh, you know, a lot of the comments that were made on the legislative. That's a very important issue. Uh, we're we're able to at least make those recommendations toward and, and put into our report uh, uh, what those legislative um, modifications might look like. Um, but right now there's a tremendous urgency, I think, on the regulatory side to uh, address what's, what's in front of us and, and what's, um, uh, what's more timely, I guess, in, in, uh, in our uh, oversight uh, capacity. And so given that, I think, you know, I think we're doing a good job here today of, of being able to focus on those pieces that we, uh, that we're charged with and, uh, and then discussing the uh, legislative pieces later. Um, with that, I'd, uh, we have a motion and a second, so if we can uh, get a roll call vote. Babillion? Nay. Sorry, can you repeat? Nay. Cermak? Nay. Clifford? Aye. Dombrowski? Aye. Farrow? Aye. Heidelbeck Terramoto? Aye. Harada? Aye. Huffman? Abstain. Jacobson? Nay. Nevidal? Nay. Nikita? No. Peck? Nay. Ron? Aye. Stevenson? No. Sweeney? No. Todd? Nay. Woolsey? Aye. Wu? Aye. You? No. The motion fails. Okay. So, given that like our to directive, make a substitute motion, uh, can we can we have a substitute motion then? Because. Uh, Quite frankly, we're, we're not gonna have time to address all of these items today. We have a charge as, a, a, you know, informing on the regulatory piece. If we go down the conversation of, of legislative, um, we are unfortunately gonna be uh, unable to address all of these items uh, in any sort of capacity. Again, the emphasis right now is on the regulatory side. That's in front of us today. That's what the BCC is, is charged with. That's where the public comment and all that has its uh, largest directive. Um, and, uh, you know, just in the interest of, of timing, Mr. if we can't get through that today, then we aren't, uh, as far as I'm concerned, doing Mr. our job. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I'll make that motion that we move all uh, regulatory uh, items for consideration to the, 
the uh, Oakland meeting in statutory, statutory excuse me, um, to the next meeting in Oakland. Second. Um, I'd like, wait, uh, I have another comment. Um, I think what we're hearing from the public is that there are a, one or two very important issues to them that we should be looking at that may fall under the statutory category. And so my motion might be to, if we've all done our homework, uh, we know which ones are clearly statutory and which ones may have some wiggle room in interpretation. And so as we go through the recommendations, um, we prioritize the ones to address at a later date and the ones to address today. I agree with that uh, recommendation because what the public's still looking for is they want these recommendations to be uh, to go on the record. Not all the recommendations are going to be agreed upon by everybody on this committee to be blanketed with one um, set of recommendations. I think if we push it off to the next meeting, we already have enough to discuss at the next meeting, and the statutory changes are going to take up a full day, either maybe set up a, an additional day to just go over strictly statutory changes, because a lot of these recommendations do cross the fine line between regulatory and statutory. So I think as we're going through them, uh, if something's statutory, flag it as statutory and set a specific date for it. My preference would be that if a subcommittee has a particular statutory recommendation, which is uh, especially timely, as does the public health one with uh, compassionate use, that we choose the one with the most, uh, the ones with the most uh, time essence and advance those only. I'm sorry, advance those where, though? I mean... In the discussion of the regulatory changes that we look at, the statutory changes that are most uh, timely and, and advance those statutory uh, regulation, or those statutory regulations only, or those statutory recommendations only. Mm -hmm. So there are some statutory recommendations that I don't need to have talked about today, but there are others that definitely should be, and we've heard from the public already about that. I just want to make a quick legal clarification. You can certainly do that, but I do want to make sure we're all on the same page about the fact that those things require statutory change. You can certainly make those recommendations to the licensing authorities. However, they do not have the authority to do what you're asking or to do anything with them. So that's something to keep in mind as we move through this process in terms of forwarding the recommendations to us. Um, the ones that we actually could take some action on versus the statutory ones that we cannot. I do understand that, but there are two assemblymen, uh, Banta and, uh, and Lackey, I think, who are advancing today uh, a reform bill for the uh, marijuana laws. And if the uh, committee as a whole recommended that something be done with a compassionate use, we should do that as early as possible in order to form those legislatures who are trying to make changes. I will. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I want to agree because I think the role of this committee, while we are regulatory, we are also the only body that can advance ideas forward. And I know the Bureau has the authority if we say we want something in legislation to propose legislation, all government entities can do that. And so even though we might not be able to fix it today, we can start the process of getting it fixed. So I <laughs> agree with, uh, I think I'm agreeing with something. <laughs> Our, uh, so, so here's our challenge, though, is that we can only deal with what's on the agenda today, um, and otherwise we haven't properly noticed this meeting. So if we have a, a, a sidebar, you know, conversation on uh, compassionate uh, issues in the state uh, related to cannabis, um, the meeting then hasn't properly been noticed. So if there are specific uh, items um, that we could pull to help facilitate that conversation that are on the agenda today, then I think we could do that. But if we're going to have a broader conversation there, um, I, I believe we are uh, uh, 
we're under a bit of a constraint. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I think people are focused on discussing that all the specific subcommittee recommendations are on the agenda. So right, right. within the context of that, I think there, there were discussions that happened and recommendations made by the subcommittee that would be the basis of those conversations. But um, I was gonna suggest perhaps a motion that says, we're gonna take the statutory items um, and move them to the meeting, the next meeting in Oakland with the caveat that a subcommittee chair that thinks there's a statutory item within their um, subcommittee that's particularly timely and should be heard today, when they do their presentation of that subcommittee chair, we allow the room to raise that specific statutory item. So the bulk of them are moved unless a subcommittee chair identifies the need today to hear one of their sub subcommittee's recommendations. I'll accept that friendly amendment. I'll accept that friendly amendment. Okay, so now we second. have a new motion second on the table. Second. Oh, I'm sorry, you gotta say your name again for the second. Jacobson. Jacobson, all right, thank you. Um, and we go back to public comment. Can you restate the motion? Can, can you restate the motion, please? Uh, I think it was, I mean, I could phrase it in terms of an amendment to the existing motion that was on the table, yeah. which was to table the statutory changes tell um, the next meeting in Oakland, and my amendment to his motion is to simply allow a subcommittee chair to raise one of their recommendations today if they feel it's particularly timely. Okay. Just a quick reminder that you can fill in the three seats, and then if you want to make a public comment in the interest of time, just queue up in the center aisle, please. There's some blue X's on the ground that you can queue up. Um, and also, we're only taking comments. We're not answering questions today. So if you have a question, please form that into a comment. And Paul, you're first up. Hi, Paul Hansbury, lovingly and legally out of Mendocino County. I think the committee members made an excellent point uh, that there is legislation that has been introduced probably today. Uh, and they can modify that, that those bills and add language uh, as uh, up until it comes to the floor for a vote. This would give a priority if it comes from the advisory committee, um, and they could add the language if they see that it's important enough that they could add it now. Because it's worth noting that your next meeting is after the, um, uh, after the session is closed. So they wouldn't have the opportunity to do it again until next session. So I think it's, it's a wonderful thing that, that the, the, the committee chairs would uh, prioritize things that are uh, of statute and even things that are ambiguous or have wiggle room between regulatory and licensing is to interpretation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Susan. Good morning again. Um, with regard to prioritizing um, items that are statutory, um, most of what we're reading here isn't, does in fact fall in that area. And um, not to overstate the obvious, but um, none of what we're doing would be happening without the plants themselves. And the 16th and 17th are the farmer's almanac days to start seeds. Um, and so the plants are not going to wait, and small farmers can't wait. Um, so I would encourage you to look carefully at each item and um, weigh how much that item will affect people who actually grow this plant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. I just want to reiterate uh, what Susan Tibbins just stated. Um, cultivation issues are happening now, um, particularly around the A and M, a lot of transport issues, those are happening now. As a nursery, I'm getting questions from cultivators uh, daily on how we have to deal with this. So I think as soon as we can get this in front of the legislator, um, these are important, timely issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, if, you're, if you want to make a public comment, please queue up right now. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Hi, uh, on the topic of testing, uh, what I've been seeing, I'm, I'm a chemist in the field, uh, the way that pesticides are measured in uh, edibles are adjusted for the, are not adjusted for the weight of the edible. They should be adjusted to the quantity of the oil that is put into the edible. Excuse me, sir. We're taking public comment right now on the pending motion about whether or not the statutory recommendations will be moved to um, another meeting date. Um, subs any comments on substantive issues on agenda items that we will be discussing can be done then. And at the end, there's a public comment period for anything not on the agenda. Okay, I understand. Well, on that note then, compassionate care certainly needs to be addressed. This entire government and the preceding ones before it 
were built here for the patients. And for cancer patients suffering from cachexia, the dosage limit on edibles is far too small. We've moved to protect uh, new adult patients coming in uh, that are just here for the recreational purposes while disregarding the patients. And I think that's important to address. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, good morning, Tim Cromartie with HTL Companies. Uh, there may be a way to, to split the baby, so I would respectfully suggest to the committee that it identify a short list of urgency items in the statutory arena that it wants to take up today, table the others perhaps for um, the next meeting, and bear in mind that for anything that is an urgency item, there are legislative deadlines. Policy committee deadlines to get out of House of Origin are in June, and fiscal committees, uh, the deadline is in August of this year, so all that, that timetable needs to be taken into consideration for the items that are more pressing. Thank you very much. Chair Ron, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, thank you. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All right, can we have a roll call vote, please? Pavilion. Aye. Ceramac. Aye. Clifford. Aye. Dombrowski. Aye. Farrow. Aye. Heidelbeck Terramoto. Aye. Harada. Aye. Huffman. Aye. Jacobson. Aye. Nevidal. Aye. Nikita. Aye. Peck. Aye. Ron. Aye. Stevenson. Aye. Sweeney. Aye. Todd. Aye. Woolsey. Aye. Wu. Aye. You. Aye. The, uh, the motion passes. I just want to remind you both up on the dais here and in the audience there that we do have a court reporter that's trying to take down everything you say, so make sure you're speaking into the microphone clearly and maybe take your pace a little slower than um, high speed so that she can um, get down all the words that are said. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, so hey, that was easy. Next one. Um, so now we have, uh, let's see, looks like four recommendations uh, under the regulatory piece for testing labs. Uh, any of the items, uh, if we could, we'd go through them one at a time, or if uh, anyone has a particular one they'd like to pull for discussion. So um, this is Catherine Jacobson. I laid out the recommendations and on reading the staff comments for recommendation number three, I'd like to amend that recommendation to say the Bureau should incorporate um, standard ref reference standards in their final, the, the Bureau should identify acceptable reference standards to be used by laboratories in the final regulations. Okay, excuse me one moment, I just wanna make it clear. So the recommendations there were voted on by the subcommittee, so you would not be able to change the recommendation at this point. The only way that could be done is through a motion at this stage. Right now? So just say, so is that your motion? <laughs> so I move to change recommendation number three to state the Bureau should define acceptable reference standards in their testing analytical methodology in final regulations. Second. Hold on one second. So the recommendation, so what you would like to do is make a motion that for number three you adopt this recommendation, not necessarily change the subcommittee's recommendation. You can't do that without a vote of the subcommittee. So you're, recommend, you were ma you're making a motion that the board adopt as recommendation three what you just stated. Is that what, what you're trying to accomplish? Okay. And I just have a question on um, if it's testing labs, is that Bureau or is that CDPH? That's Bureau, CDPH, right? Okay. No. <coughs> the Bureau regulates testing labs. <coughs> I have a question yes. um, regarding the motion, um, Member Nevidal. Um, I'm I'm curious about um, the same reference 
standards being used and would this motion still hold the same or um, standardized testing analytical methodologies? So I, I withdraw that uh, amendment because I can't make it without the subcommittee, so the recommendation stands as is. Would you restate it, please? The Bureau should incorporate standard testing analytical methodology and final regulations. I'm modifying myself. Sorry. You're seconding? Does this mean that the committee as a whole cannot uh, um, amend any of these recommendations from the subcommittee? It's not that you can't amend. You can amend the subcommittee's actual recommendation, but what you can do is you can um, make a motion to adopt a recommendation that um, is on the same topic but, say, slightly changed through your discussions here today. Does that make more sense? Is that clear? So you can't really change the recommendation, but you can... Adopt it, reject it, modify it as the committee's um, decision on that particular recommendation. Thanks for that clarification. Okay, so in that case, um, I am I am recommending as the the subcommittee chair on testing laboratories that we adopt recommendation number one as stated, that we adopt recommendation number two as stated, that we modify recommendation number three to state. The Bureau should, in, should define acceptable reference standards in the final regulations. And we should adopt recommendation number four as stated. Second. Was that t intended to be a motion? OK. So we have a motion and a second. Great. Mr. Chairman, I thought you had a motion on the floor in a second. I, I, I can't follow how we're proceeding here. We have, we have, she withdrew her original motion because it we needed the subcommittee to, uh, uh, to, to address that issue. So she's providing uh, recommendations uh, for, um, she her first for, for first motion. The second motion she just provided is supplanting that. So, yeah. So we have a motion and a second by Mr. Sweeney. All right. Sorry. Um, any other discussion among members? Yes. I just need some clarification, Heidelbach Terramoto, on recommendation number two, the expiration date. In another subcommittee panel, I believe it was the distribution. Um, some of the concerns were that if the testing levels were incorrect on the package that the distributor would be able to relabel it. So in recommendation number two where it states that what the manufacturer puts on the product stays on until it is expired, is that what I'm understanding? No, this was, um, this is a recommendation just to allow uh, manufacturers to get a test and have that test be valid until their um, expiration date. So this would not prohibit, my understanding is that this would not prohibit relabeling if that's required. Um, that, does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, recommendation number two, it also says, as determined by the manufacturer, if it's tested and the distributor is responsible for the testing, how would it be determined by the manufacturer? So the manufacturer puts on an expiration date on the product, and the, so the manufacturer determines the expiration date of the product, and the manufacturer is responsible for, all the, for the content of that product until that expiration date. So the distributor is not held responsible for the expiration date of the product, just the manufacturer. So this particular issue, if I can add a legal clarification for you, um, was that the testing results for that particular product would only be valid until that um, expiration date put on by the manufacturer, which it's my understanding on certain products are required to do. Um, and so at that point, the testing results would no longer be valid. Therefore, you would not be able to, to sell that product any longer. 
Okay, I know. I'm just reading it by letter of it. It says, regulation should clarify that the testing results are valid on a finished manufactured canvas product until the expiration date of the finished product as determined by the manufacturer. If we could add clarification that it's the expiration date that's determined by the manufacturer, not the testing. I believe it already, it does say that as determined by the manufacturer in the recommendation, the second sentence, the last clause as determined by the manufacturer. No, I understand. What I'm saying is it's not clear if it's referring to the testing results or the expiration date. I'm, conf I'm confused by what you're saying. The testing result is the testing result on the manufactured product, and that testing result is valid on that manufactured product until the expiration date of the product, which is determined by the manufacturer. Why don't we just change the language to what you just said, which is determined by the manufacturer? Exactly. If we can change the word as to which, it provides clarity because the problem with regulations is it's pretty express, and if it's stated on there, now it opens it up to interpretation, where the as determined by the manufacturer is not clear if it's referencing the testing results or if it's referencing the finished product expiration date. I see. Okay. So you would like it to state regulations should clarify that the testing results are valid on a finished manufactured cannabis product until the expiration date of the finished product, which is determined by the manufacturer. Correct. Can I just make a quick clarification, too? I think right now what you have in front of you are recommendations from the subcommittees, which basically indicate um, some direction that you'd like to provide to the licensing authorities. It is not, at least the way the recommendations were done by these subcommittees, it's not the actual final language that will be in the regulation. If the recommendation goes forward and the licensing authorities do decide to take that recommendation, we'll then craft the very specific regulatory language based on the recommendation and the law and making sure it's um, consistent with all the rest of the recommendations in terms of, our, of the uses for defined terms and whatnot. So as long as you've got the, what you want done in here, um, it won't necessarily be the final language that'll be in the regulation. Okay, any other discussion? Seeing I just had a question on BCC com staff comments on item number three. It says Bureau estimates 36 months to complete all of uh, the above. Given that there's a lot of inconsistency on, on, on test results right now between you know manufacturers and, and distributors when they test, is, is that really what we're saying is for 36 months we might be dealing with inconsistent test results? This is going to also apply when it comes to uh, manufacturers and, and distributors for labeling uh, discussions down the road. So uh, maybe I can clarify. After reading through the staff comments from the BCC, I amended that recommendation to specifically incorporate um, defined and accepted reference standards so that um, I think if, if they address that piece, then the language that they've written is sufficient uh, to ensure standardized testing for now. Um, I have a, a question about um, acceptable reference standards because um, I'm definitely not an expert in lab testing, but it's my um, layperson's understanding that um, reference standards for cannabis are very costly and they're hard to come by, so most people actually develop their own reference standards in-house, and so the issue isn't necessarily the reference standard, it's the validation of the standard that they create and utilize, so that every time they um, bring a new standard or develop a new standard, they need to um, uh, validate and calibrate so that there is consistency in how that reference asks, excuse me, acts as a baseline. That's correct, but there are um, reference standards that are available, and unless labs are using the same reference standards, uh, we can't ensure reproducible results. And there, I guess, there are reference standards available for certain cannabinoids, but not for all of them. So. Um, maybe we should put in there that the 
we should amend that to say the Bureau should ident define acceptable reference standards um, if they exist. <coughs> Right, because the, the problem with every, every th there's, there are THC reference standards that you can buy from, from companies in the U.S., and we know that those are, um, those contain exactly what they say they contain, because they come from labs that are uh, regulated, right? There may not be, so we know that that exists for THC and CBD and some other cannabinoids. There may not be reference standards for sale for certain minor cannabinoids yet, but, but if you leave it in the hands of each lab to define their own reference standards, then there's no baseline comparison between labs. Right. I, I know this has been a problem in many states, but I think um, the issue is um, ensuring that there's um, validation of any reference standard used and calibration of the equipment more than mandating an exact reference standard. So the problem is if you don't mandate the reference standard, there's no comparison because each lab can come up with their own reference standard. And then the, the, even if you have the same methodology in place across labs, if they're using different reference standards, they're going to come up with different results. So even if you have a, a process in-house in place to develop a reference standard, there's no guarantee that that same process would um, result in the same reference standard at another lab. So if you're getting the reference standard from a third party, you know that it's always the same. Okay, any other conversation here? All right, let's move on to uh, public comment then. Um, okay. My, uh, uh, just Sorry, just a quick reminder. If you could queue up in the center, that'd be great. All right, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, my comment is in reference to recommendation number nine, uh, in reference to yeah. edibles. I'm sorry. We're, we're dealing with... Uh, Testing laboratories, recommendations one, two, three, and four. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. My name is uh, Joseph Evans, and I've been a lab director at two cannabis testing laboratories in Colorado and also a small business uh, environmental lab here in California. And my point that I wanted to make is in reference to a comment that is not on here, which I feel is going to be confusing later on. But in the proposed regulations in 5250B, it states that the sampler and the laboratory, the laboratory can only take samples or analyze samples from the sampler. That's fine, and I understand the intent of that. But one of the things you're going to do is you're going to subcontract certain analyses at certain times in any analytical laboratory that you run, especially in a small business laboratory because you do not have redundancy when equipment goes down or an analyst quits. So subcontracting to a second certified marijuana testing laboratory should be in the language somewhere. Okay, excuse yes. me, sir. We're only dealing with recommendations one through four on testing labs for those of you providing comment. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next up. Hi, Aaron Riley, CannaSafe Analytics. We were the first ISO accredited lab in cannabis. Uh, my comment is on number three, um, and as you guys were referencing reference standards, there's two different types of standards. There's ones that we buy, um, which, which you were talking about, are from a third party, and that's how we do QC, like Emerald Scientific. There's several other companies that sell those standards to all the labs. Um, and then internal QC standards, which we run per regulations four per 20, samples we have to run for QCs. Those are an internal mix that basically makes sure we're in line with the, the, the reference standards, just for say for THC. Um, and they do have, I think, 40 something standards available. All of the uh, cannabinoids that are on the regulations are available by third party vendors. Um, and then also in terms of standardizing analytical methodology, I think the state, did, the BCC did a good job in, in 
the way that THC is reported, we've seen a lot of variance in that. People have been backing out moisture or recording it with moisture. So I think the, the way to standardize that would be to do that per analysis. So per pesticides, you have to use the same basically reporting formula to, to get to the certain PPMs um, as per regulations. Thank you. Next up. Hi, my name is Sabino Seguera, Digamma Consulting. <clears throat> I just want to reiterate what the previous speaker said about um, topic number three and uh, the available reference standards. There are many reference standards available from many different manufacturers, and they are not expensive with, with respect to the cost of running a uh, QC certified lab. Now, um, and that being said, I'm also on Nevada's Laboratory Advisory Committee, and we went through this problem a couple of years ago where we saw that the reference standard, there was about a 30% swing in uh, laboratory results. And the state did a round robin, and at least half of that was caused by um, inconsistent reference standards. N and not all reference standards are made equal. There are even different companies that make reference standards that when you test them with respect to each other, they don't yield the exact same absorbance that, that you should see. So I think choosing one reference standard to base the labels off of is a very, very wise idea and will help us to more quickly get into alignment between laboratories. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up. Uh, Tim Moreland, River Distributing. Um, definitely in favor of uh, reference standards from the state. Um, just a real world perspective of how this works for us. Uh, we represent about 30 suppliers. Uh, we've ran about 70 state certified tests or facilitated those with our two testing laboratories. Um, most of those results come out differently. The manufacturer will run a Q&A test and they will put that, those results on the package. They will send it to our distribution facility. We'll have it tested with our lab. And sometimes it's the same lab as our suppliers using and we will get wildly different test results. And so what that means for a distributor, we have two options. We can send the product back to the supplier and that possibly that product never makes it into the retail market. Or two, the only option we have is to be able to relabel the THC amount, um, which if you have ever seen, like you have to put a sticker over the stated THC amount and it's kind of ugly and it costs a lot of money on operations costs, especially when you have an order of uh, 10,000 you know, single units. Uh, that adds up very quickly for operation staff and it's quite expensive for distributors we need to have some reference standards. Otherwise, uh, it's going to create a huge problem in the market. So definitely in favor of this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next up. Good morning, Sunshine Lunch Show. I just want to echo other people who have supported uh, having a single reference standard. I think ultimately we want to be able to self-test as manufacturers and distributors in this industry and without having a public facing reference standard we're supposed to test against, that will not be something we can evolve towards. I would also encourage you to look at the fiscal impact of creating a state reference standard. There are other recommendations that involve um, sampling by the Bureau, so it's with, well within the Bureau's authority to do so. It would also allow people who have different outlets to have consistent consistency statewide as an ISO certification does not tell you whether or not in lab is actually going to have the same result. It's a public health issue and it's something that we should take very seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Next up. Hi, Kathy Warner from Steep Hill. Um, I, we certainly agree with uh, standards across the industry, we, uh, but I think we all agree that they're not completely there yet. I just don't want this committee to ultimately um, discourage research and development and rapidly moving technology that will actually benefit the industry and public health by setting those standards either too low or interfering with proprietary standards that have been developed um, by uh, technology companies in the state of California. Thank you. Thank you. Next up. Well, my name is Daniel Crane. Uh, I work with uh, ACGI Consulting Group. Um, we just, I just wanted to mention that we don't need to reinvent the wheel for a lot of these protocols. They exist for other agricultural crops for determining E. coli and um, Botrytis scenario, things that are actually going to cause people to fail their testing requirements and have to destroy that batch from the crop. Nobody's going to fail a test from having a, uh, an off reference sample for an obscure cannabinoid, you know. So the actually important things that need to be tested for, for us as producers already exist and should just be adopted from the agricultural um, community. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, Ross Gordon, California Growers Association. Um, we have a lot of concerns about testing and costs, but it seems like cultivation uh, subcommittee recommendations are maybe the more appropriate place to talk about those. Um, on the subject of these committee recommendations, specifically on the first recommendation, uh, which deals with easing barriers around informational testing, um, this is a really important issue um, for our members and one that, that's maybe been a little overlooked in the regulations. There are lots of reasons to arrange for informational or non-certified testing for reasons other than uh, certifying products as safe for final sale. Um, we agree with uh, the recommendation that the subcommittee put forward, um, and in order to further those goals, um, we would also suggest an amendment to section uh, 5315G, uh, subsection 3 of the BCC regulations. Um, this regulation says that a transport-only distributor is not able to transport product to a licensed testing laboratory. Um, we think that totally makes sense if you're talking about certified testing. Um, but if we're talking about testing for informational purposes only, um, we think that the transporter license should be able to um, arrange for that. Um, without that amendment, uh, we think it may be very difficult to realize the intent of recommendation number one in practice um, because it'll be very difficult to uh, be able to actually get that physical product to testing laboratories uh, for informational testing. Thank you. Thank you. Last two speakers. Um, my recommendation is uh, to keep a standard of quality for the standards that we are talking about. Uh, there's ISO certification regulations that have been in existence for a while that other labs use to create their standards, and I think that we should require that level of analysis in order to create a standard, whether it's in-house or out-of-house, so long as it is at the same quality of standard verified by the same instrumentations methods that are employed by other laboratories outside of this industry, then I think that those standards should be able to be created by in any manner that you want. And for the reason being that companies that sell these standards that we already are existing and have been gone through certificate of analysis protocols sometimes are not strong enough because these companies cannot sell a high enough dosage for our testing in order to be accurate and remain within the windows of the quantification there. And that's something, uh, an issue that I've run into in developing tests, that the standard is not potent enough for the products that we're going to be testing against it. And that would deteriorate the quality of the test far further than if we had created our own standards. Thank you. <clears throat> Next up. Oh, uh, the gentleman on the left, yeah. Yeah, I had a recommendation on the final point on waste disposal. Uh, my recommendation to the committee is for there to be uh, a body for state licensure for waste disposals because right now there's kind of a lack of, there's a lot of confusion in the waste disposal area about how much can be taken, about uh, the volumes that can be disposed of at one time. There should be a, a board that can decide who can contract, if you're going to do subcontracting for that waste disposal and then go through a state body and be approved would be my recommendation. Thank you. Next, next up. Hi, my name is Alexis D'Angelo with the California Cannabis Industry Association. Um, for the standard testing and analysis methodology, standard, standardization and consistency are valid concerns with regards to testing laboratories, but the cannabis industry is too new to have well-established and validated methodologies. It is unrealistic to expect standardization with, when all the potential analyses that have not even been tested yet. Setting appropriate criteria, possibly incorporating standard methodologies from other industries would be a great step in the right direction. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify once again on the waste disposal issue. For those of you who sat on the enforcement committee, I apologize for repeating myself. As a licensed ex manufacturer currently operating within the county of LA, the manufacturers and as well as multiple other license holders are not experiencing challenges when it comes to waste disposal. We are operating within the confines of the county and the city and our municipal waste hauler. Thank you so much. Thank you. Chair, that concludes the public comment. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Uh, any other comments from the members? We repeat the motion. Um, you, you can ask the court reporter to read it back. The motion? No. No? Or do you? She should. That's why she's here. Please. 
The motion on the table by Member Jacobson is for the committee to adopt recommendation number one as stated, recommendation number two as stated, recommendation three to read. The Bureau should define acceptable reference standards and to adopt recommendation number four as stated. Okay. Move the previous question. All right. Can I have a roll call, please? Babulian. Aye. Cermak. Aye. Clifford. Aye. Dombrowski. Aye. Farrow. Aye. Heidelback Terremoto. Aye. Harada. Aye. Huffman. Aye. Jacobson. Aye. Nevidal. Aye. Nikita. Aye. Peck. Aye. Ron. Aye. Stevenson. Aye. Sweeney. Aye. Todd. Aye. Woolsey? Aye. Wu? Aye. You? Aye. The motion passes. All right. That's uh, number 13. Moving on back to number four. Discussion and possible action to approve, modify, or reject subcommittee on cultivators recommendation. Uh, Ms. Nevidal. So, um, since the vast majority of these are statutory, would you like me to simply go through the first two recommendations that are regulatory and then make a recommendation without reading through all of yes, the statutory please. components? Okay. Um, so, um, uh, Kristen Nevidal, I chaired the um, cultivation subcommittee. Um, we met two times, and I feel like we had very good attendance and frankly heard a lot of the same issues throughout both subcommittee meetings. Um, recommendation number one um, refers to generator hour meters, and the subcommittee had recommended that um, there be an amendment to section 8306 subsection D to allow aftermarket non-resettable hour meter meters be to be installed if feasible. Um, uh, staff comments here um, note that there is nothing currently in the regulations that prohibits um, the installation of aftermarket um, non-resettable hour meters on generators. So um, that's it for recommendation number one. Um, recommendation number two um, is in reference to the outdoor cultivation definition. Um, the subcommittee recommended that the definition of outdoor cultivation should allow the use of light deprivation techniques, provided that it does not allow for the increase in the number of crop cycles. Um, staff comments indicate that the recommendation would be difficult to implement and track if an outdoor cultivator could have more than one harvest by using light deprivation techniques, and that the staff would prefer to avoid associating the definition of indoor, outdoor, mixed light to a specific number of harvests. Um, is it best for me to pause there and have discussion about the regulatory components before making a statutory recommendation? Okay. Um, so moving forward um, to the um, statutory changes or the recommendations requiring statutory changes. Um, um, some of the most prominent comments that we received in the subcommittee um, really had a lot to do with recommendation number five, which pertains to the cultivation or the transport of product by cultivators. And that recommendation also kind of carries over into item number 11, self-transport distribution. Um, so going back to um, number five, um, this was during our first meeting, this conversation came up quite a bit, and we recommended that cultivators should be allowed to transport their product to nearby licensed processors without obtaining additional licensure so long as they account for the net weight of the product um, before it's transferred. Um, of course, this um, really requires a statutory change, which is why we're talking about it in this context. Um, one of the things I'll say about this, and, and I do want to jump over to recommendation number 11 next, um, is that we heard um, a tremendous amount of comment about the challenges cultivators are facing, especially in the rural area, in getting this product off their farm in a timely fashion. There's a tremendous amount of concern that was expressed about um, 
challenges that cultivators are facing around um, how zoning um, challenges their ability to cultivate, say, on an agricultural parcel and then potentially handle post-harvest activities. So in the um, drying, trimming, and curing um, activities that are associated with the cultivation license, um, many localities look at those activities as being commercial and then require um, zoning that doesn't always fit with the cultivation portion. So um, there is a tremendous amount of concern and I think frustration with farmers that they won't be able to get their crop out of the field in a timely fashion and to a processor if they cannot process on site. We're dealing with an incredibly perishable crop. Um, and then the other piece um, around transportation is in item number 11. Um, the Bureau had created a self-transport distribution license, which cultivators had hoped to really utilize to remedy some of these issues. But then we get into this premise issue. So um, number 11, we had recommended the creation of a mechanism for cultivators to conduct self-transportation distribution of their own product to a centralized processing facility, manufacturing facility, distributor, or a lab for pre-testing without having to be held to the same requirements of the existing transportation license, including BCC regulations sections 5044 and 5047 by either amending the existing transportation distribution license or creating a new license type. Um, concerns are that a cultivator is already storing this product on their facility as part of their cultivation license. So, but once they want to um, transport it through a self-transport distribution license, they have to um, qualify not only through local zoning, but meet all of the regulations of a self-transport distributor, which means they would have to have the cameras and the alarms and the separate premise to operate from within their property. And these are just posing very significant challenges to cultivators. Um, I do want to note that um, in addition, within the statutory components, we have a compassion piece. This um, committee also heard um, a lot of testimony from stakeholders around issues with compassion program and the lack thereof. And specifically, um, our recommendation is in reference to the cultivation tax. Um, we recommended that language should be developed to create a cultivation-based um, tax incentive for products being set aside for compassionate use programs. Um, and um, just to respect time, I know there's a lot of things that we could take out of here. A lot of our comments or recommendations from the subcommittee are statutory, but I feel like those were the most um, priority repeated, um, kind of the most emphasized by stakeholders. Okay, thank you. So let's let's start with uh, uh, motion and recommendations for the uh, regulatory changes first. So um, with that said, so we we're going to start with regulatory changes that would really be in relationship to um, recommendation number one. Um, which is the allowance for aftermarket non-resettable hour meters to be installed if feasible on folks generators so they wouldn't have to get a bigger generator. Um, recommendation number two would be to allow the definition of outdoor cultivation to use light deprivation techniques provided it does not allow for an increase in the number of crop cycles. Um, in, so I, I guess I can leave it there for discussion please. Just for clarification, are you making a motion that the full committee adopt recommendations one and two of the subcommittee? Is, is that what you're wanting to do? I would say yes. Um, I, I'll make that a motion, yes. Second. All right, I have a motion and a second. Any conversation? Colleagues? Member Nikita, is yes, there sir. someone here on staff who can sort of clarify the concerns raised for recommendation number two about implementation? Yes, this is uh, Richard Parrott with CDFA. So the, the concern was it would be um, difficult to enforce and track if we 
um, take that recommendation and limit it to a number of, um, I think the, the recommendation is um, limiting to, a, as long as it doesn't increase the number of crop cycles, that would be um, difficult for enforcement and tracking. Um, we've looked at that and um, it may be, there may be an option in, in perhaps looking at the, um, uh, looking at a definition for light deprivation it might be another way. But um, as, as that recommendation currently is, it would be difficult for CDFA to track and enforce. So with that said, um, I could potentially make a friendly amendment to eliminate that section of that motion. So um, the motion would be to adopt um, recommendation number one as it currently reads and then amend recommendation number two to eliminate that second section. So um, recommendation number two would then read the definition of outdoor, outdoor cultivation should allow the use of light deprivation techniques, period. Can, can we... Uh... I think, I mean, I think if we do that, we kind of lose the rationale behind the, the concern addressed by the original proposal, which is that, as I recall, there are reasons to do light depth that we wanted to encourage and enable. For example, if someone wants to get another crop, get a first crop in before the height of the dry season so they can use less water, for example, and other conservation-oriented practices, but the license type is, the, the fee is based on the assumption that if you're doing light depth, you have, you know, you're producing more plants and therefore you have a higher fee. And I think we want to... I thought license fees were based on the direct and indirect costs of the issuance and the activities of issuing those licenses. You may be right, but there was a concern, as I recall in the discussion, that we wanted to, that we wanted to make clear that what we were doing was enabling light depth to be used in a way that wouldn't necessarily increase production, but actually would enable certain conservation measures. That's what I recall. And if, if we take away that, the, the purpose of that limitation was to make that distinction. And I, I, I feel like our, our discussion was such that if we take that away, we're kind of opening this up broader than we had intended, more broadly than we had intended at our committee discussion. And I, I would also comment, I, it was in addition to finishing, if, if uh, a crop was coming up a time where they weren't going to be able to finish in a timely fashion before weather conditions changed or something, the idea of using light deprivation was to allow that crop to get out. And I, I agree with you that the cost of the licensing is supposed to be determinative about the cost of being able to provide oversight. The problem is, is if you put it in a situation where there will be more crops, that will mean requirement of more oversight, which would drive the cost to these outdoor folks to a higher level. I don't think they want that either. Um, I, I don't think there would necessarily be more oversight because the outdoor season is simply the outdoor season. If you can't use artificial lighting in the setting to help um, increase your ability to extend flower periods, you're not going to be increasing the cultivation season. You may possibly get two harvests under the proposed elimination of the harvest restriction in the northern part of the state, and you may get more as we move farther south. Um, but this would not necessarily extend anyone's season, just to be clear. To chime in a little, I think it's important to note the difference between outdoor and light depth. Um, outdoor, you don't really have the fixtures. You don't have the, call it a greenhouse, um, the vehicle where you would be able to attach light deprivation components to it. So if the overall spirit of the being of outdoor operators being allowed to use light deprivation techniques to either save a harvest, salvage a harvest, beat the uh, natural elements, maybe the, defi uh, the defining characteristic between outdoor and light depth would be the use of the actual light deprivation fixture itself and not necessarily depriving the plants of light or supplementing with artificial light. So if you're an outdoor grower, you're growing outdoors. Um, you need to beat the weather or something like that. You're allowed to bring in and introduce light depriving techniques or light enhancing techniques, but because you don't year-round have the greenhouse fixture, the light deprivation um, casing housing for the plants, I don't think that would even be an issue. You get the outdoor, but you also get the flexibility to be able to save your crop at the end of the year. Okay, 
So are we modifying your motion or as is? Um, well, I had proposed a friendly amendment um, to eliminate the second portion of recommendation number two, so that recommendation number two would simply read that the definition of outdoor cultivation should allow the use of light deprivation techniques, but I have not heard a second to that friendly, or that friendly amendment. All right, Mr. Sweeney? Yes, I will second that. All right. I do have a comment regarding item number one. Um, I would recommend that there's no need for action. Uh, according to CDFA, it appears that uh, the use of after hour or after market meters are, is already allowed under uh, regulations. So is that a suggestion that we remove that from the motion? I, I think the clarity is helpful to the public. Um, it was just a comment. Right. Well, and, and let's remember that, you know, these are, these are recommendations that go back to uh, the Bureau and, and, and staff. So if it's, if it's redundant or whatever, it, it's okay, right? It still gets on the record and they can take that consideration. So that's fine. Okay. Uh, Excuse I, me. If light deprivation uh, enables someone to have an additional crop cycle, does that then make this a statutory problem? I don't believe so because there is no reference to the number of crop cycles allowed in any of the statutory components. So this is Crystal D'Souza, staff counsel with CDFA. Um, no, it would not create a statutory issue. There was no definition in statute as to what outdoor cultivation was. Okay. Let's move on to uh, public comment then. Okay, public comment. So just a quick reminder, everyone, um, if you're having uh, sidebar conversations, if you could pretty please take those out in the hallway. Um, it gets kind of hard to hear. Um, we are taking public comment on cultivators. Um, the motion on the floor is to accept recommendation number one and two with a friendly amendment to number two to end the second section at light deprivation techniques full stop. So with that, if you have a public comment, please queue up and then uh, once a seat is taken, just feel free to sit down. I did not see who sat first, so I'll just let you begin. <laughs> uh, Ross Gordon, California Growers Association. Um, our common concerns, uh, the misclassification or our perceived misclassification of, of certain uh, regulatory recommendations as statutory recommendations, uh, specifically recommendations number six dealing with AM uh, licensees, number nine uh, lab testing, uh, number 11 distribution self transport. I'm sorry, and we're, yeah, gonna have to... we're just commenting on. I, I believe this is germane because the motion deals with the approval or modification of the recommendations, and I'm discussing it's the, re items the number... removal of Excuse me. recommendations, which Excuse are regulatory me. recommendations. It's item number one and two that we're dealing with first. The rest we'll be dealing with in a second uh, motion, but right now we're just talking about items number one and two. All right. Uh, in that case, I'll just say I think these have been misclassified, and that is important to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in regards to item number two, it's vital to the small cultivator, um, particularly the cottage level, um, to give these small farmers the ability to have a product that can compete without the cost associated. So it's very vital that uh, these be adopted. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Howdy. Uh, so in regards to recommendation two, uh, there were concerns about the ability to sort of uh, regulate and actually monitor multiple harvests. And so uh, I'm, I'm, my comment is that with metric track and trace that's coming to California eventually, the, the ability to monitor the number of harvests that a cultivator has will, will, will be pretty simple. You know, if someone reports a metric that they have a harvest in July and then another one in September, then you know they had multiple harvests. And so I, I, I would encourage you to not be as concerned about the ability to regulate the number of crop cycles. Thank you. Max Piccolos with K Street Consulting on behalf of Flocana. Um, I wish to make a comment on uh, recommendation number two in support of the amended motion. Um, simply put, the recommendation by going and allowing light deprivation techniques to be used by outdoor growers um, fixes um, language that's in the mixed life co light cultivation definition, which said that mixed light is either with supplemental lighting or light depth techniques. If you're allowed to go and do light depth techniques with an outdoor license, you don't need supplemental lighting, and that should be not fall into a mixed category. It should fall into an outdoor-only category. So Flocon is in support of this change. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi. Hi there. Um, Emma Snuggs, Legislative Liaison for the California Cannabis Industry Association. Um, I'm speaking here on behalf of the CCI Agricultural Committee. Um, we are in support of the recommendation with amendment. Thank you. Thanks so much. Chair, that ends public comment. Okay, we had motion and second on the floor. Let's see, any other comments from the members? Move the previous question. All right, let's have a roll call vote, please. Mobilian? Aye. Cermak? Aye. Clifford? No. Dombrowski? Aye. Barrow? Aye. Heidelback Terramoto? Aye. Harada? Aye. Huffman? Aye. Jacobson? Aye. Nikita? Aye. Eck? Aye. Ron? Aye. Stevenson? Aye. Sweeney? Aye. Todd? Aye. Woolsey? Aye. Wu? Aye. You? Aye. The motion passes. And Nevidal would like to vote aye as well. Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> Nevidal. Aye. <laughs> sorry, member. Okay, now let's move on to the uh, items that you had in the legislature. The statutory component. So, um, okay, so moving back to the statutory um, recommendations, um, definitely um, recommendations. We find recommendation number five, the transport by cultivators, um, which can easily be tied into recommendation number 11 to be um, of critical importance. Um, additionally, um, I would have to say that the A and M piece. Um, which I failed to mention the first time, um, is of critical importance as well to cultivators. Um, so um, the recommendation relating to that is item number six. And um, the recommendation was recognizing that the existing system of keeping adult use and medical use separate places great financial planning and efficiency burdens on cultivators, potentially affecting the supply chains um, we recommended allowing cultivated materials to be transferred between A and M licenses until the point of sale. Um, so I would say that those issues, um, in addition to the compassion piece that we mentioned earlier, um, are priorities for the subcommittee, if I may be so bold. And so I'm not sure like, um, how we're handling these. Are we looking to create a motion to adopt them as statutory recommendations today and then table the rest to the next meeting? Is that, I mean? So I believe that the motion that was adopted was that anything that was in the statutory um, headings would be moved to, that, to the prior, the further meeting, I'm sorry, in April. However, if the chair of the subcommittee wanted to consider them, any of them today um, that they felt were important, they could hear today, they could identify those in the way you would, if you want to make a motion to consider, a motion related to them, you could do that. Thank you for the clarification. Um, so with that in mind, then um, um, I would, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion. We'll see how this goes. So um, my recommendation would be or my motion would be to accept recommendation number six um, as it currently reads. Um, recommendation number 11 as it currently reads. And sorry, I've lost my space here. Um, and recommendation number seven in relationship to compassionate use programs as it currently reads. Um, the reason for not including recommendation number five is that I feel if recommendation number 11 were to pass, number five would be covered. As a second. And let me just clarify, it was actually the next meeting, I think the original motion is when those would be considered. My understanding was that we would make motions on priorities today and move the remainder. No. Yes, you're correct. I just meant that the ones that are being moved from the original motion would be moved to the next advisory committee meeting. Yes. Okay. So a question on the M&A and the statutory. I think the M&A conversation is something that's going to come up in every single subcommittee. Can we get a clear um, explanation between the difference on the statutory and the regulatory side, what can be changed and what can't be? Because if it's part of every single subcommittee uh, recommendation, 
might as well be able to touch on it if there are certain things that are regulatory that could be touched on, if it's statutory and gets moved to Oakland. And this is Member Nikita. Can I also ask for just a, a statement by somebody in the know here? What is the what is the issue we're getting at here? Because I was not on this subcommittee. Not this did not come up in my two subcommittees, so I'd like some more information on it. Pertaining specifically to the M and A. So um, currently, cultivators who hold both A and M licensure on the same plot of garden area have to declare. Um, when they acquire seed or propagation material, whether that plant material is going to be part of the adult use supply chain or the medical supply chain. And they cannot cross that material back and forth. So um, if you have 10,000 square feet, you have to decide exactly in the beginning how much of that plant material will be adult use or medical. And so there's been a tremendous amount of concern that we're going to see um, potential excesses in one area of the supply chain while we have shortages in the other area of the supply chain and no ability to remedy that. Also, um, as this is really just whole plant material, there's nothing distinguishing it as an adult use product versus a medical product, especially at this point in the um, seed to sale cycle. And so um, it doesn't necessarily make sense for us to apply those labels to it. Um, and it creates a, just a cost point and then a, a real logistical challenge for cultivators who really don't know how manufacturers are gonna wanna utilize this product or how retailers are gonna want to use this product down the road. Also, also to add to that, and so we can all be aware of what some of the implications are, the plant gets designated as A or M at the cultivation level, and it stays with the life of the plant throughout the life cycle all the way to, through to the end user consumer. So if we end up with a de facto adult use market, because you have a situation where if a patient doesn't register for a county card or state card, they end up in a de facto adult use uh, situation. You have a lot of cities that are adopting medical regulations but are not addressing the adult use. There are just a lot of issues that come up. There are gonna be a lot of supply issues that come up. And a lot of it ties back to the fact that the plants get tagged MRA at the foundation level, at the seed level, long before you know what's going on. And for the cultivator to be able to react and pivot to the market, the problem is it's not an overnight fix. It's not a one month fix. You're looking at a three, four, five month cycle. And that's assuming your first cycle with full ramp up. So, yeah. And one, one last point of uh, discussion that we had. It also deals with natural disasters, uh, such as a fire that occurred up in the northern counties of this state where parts of crops or total crops got run. So the ability to be able to shift at some point is important. Or let's use, for example, if there's a, a overspray and a portion of your crop gets contaminated with pesticides from a neighboring garden, if you had that one um, identified at that point, you could no longer, you'd be short of that particular crop. So there's a lot of reasons that prior to going to uh, market, it makes sense. But like the gentleman asked, what was the genesis possibly from the agencies for wanting this designation so early? We, we, we had member, a member Stevenson, I'd like to also say that the retail uh, subcommittee, this issue has come up as well. And it's a huge hindrance in, in terms of how do we attempt to purchase in the right space, whether you know you have an adult market that's growing or a medical market that's growing. It's, one is gonna succeed to the other and it makes it very difficult. And the A&M issue is something that's mirroring across many different platforms. I'm left wondering uh, whether or not there's going to be any problem with this uh, cultivation tax uh, incentive for uh, medic medicinal marijuana, which is going to be used for compassionate use. Um, because certainly once that tax incentive is given, you can't at any later rate, at later part in the process, be switching M to A. So there's a complication there, I think. So we had a fairly extensive discussion in the subcommittee about whether we could do this within the existing statute or not. And you know, we're certainly not legal experts in this area, at least I'm not. 
But we thought we could. And, you know, we, we've got some staff kind of a one sentence thing saying no. So I'd be really interested in kind of hearing exactly where we run afoul of the statutory scheme. And I'm not convinced there's not some way to do something here without violating the statute. Um, and to your point, uh, Member Clifford, we had recommended the transfer between A and M specifically to, it's my recollection, to try to avoid statutory, statutory hangups. Um, so the idea was that if a cultivator was licensed both A and M, that they should, and they would have both A and M track and trace systems that they would be operating, that they should be able to transfer the product from one internal A track and trace to an internal M track and trace or vice versa. And so that was why we chose to word this recommendation in the manner that we did. All right, can we have the CDFA Council <laughs> comment, please? Yeah, so Crystal D'Souza again, CDFA Staff Council. Um, so there's statutory language regarding um, that license types need to be designated as A or M. Uh, when they're assigned, and then the track and trace labels that have to be applied to the product have to be under that license. There's currently no um, statutory authorization for um, product to go between license types among the, uh, even if you hold an A&M &M license. And so once the label is affixed and designated as A&M, there's no statutory authority for that to be switched to a different license type. Even with, and I can only speak to the cultivator side of it. And then I think there's also some uh, tax implications as it moves through the chain, which is why it would require a statutory change. But there's no tax implications at the cultivation level, is my understanding, because everyone pays the cultivation tax regardless of whether they're A or M. It's the same rate. Right, but uh, that again, that goes back to the. Uh, statement I was making about the license types. So it's not just the tax. So I think I was speaking later in the process with respect to the taxes part, but the, for the cultivation, you have to designate as an A license type or an M license type. You can also be both, but when you assign your uh, UID or your track and trace label, you're doing it under the specific license you're assigned. So then switching it isn't, there really is no statutory framework for doing that. Member Stevenson would yes, like sir. to make a recommendation, and I, I don't know if it's out of order, but I think that the recommendation should be one fee for both licenses. And the impetus of that is if you're operating in the, in the marketplace and you're operating in a municipality that allows for either A or M or both, the tax revenue is still going to be derived. And there's a uh, huge barrier to entry when you're asking for two license fees to operate in the market, whether it's A or M. Okay, appreciate the comment, Mr. Stevenson. That's not part of the motion. I mean, I think we, <laughs> so it's hard to, to sneak it in because it's not on this uh, specific, these specific items. So um, maybe we could table that for a conversation in a future, put that on a future agenda item. Would you like to table it as a recommendation? Yeah, can we, can we put that, can you bring 15, that up at the end of the meeting as a future agenda items? Sure. All right, wonderful. Mr. Mr. Chair, can I add? Mr. Stevenson's uh, request is actually included in one of our recommendations for a licensing subcommittee. Okay. Okay. Call for the question. Actually, I have another question before we move um, on that item. I have a question about item recommendation number 11. Um, and if I understand it correctly, there's a proposal that um, the recommendation allows for the self-transport to be done without the same requirements of 5044 and 5047, which are the video surveillance requirements and the alarm requirements. Uh, and if that's true, I'm wondering why there's a recommendation to allow cannabis activity without the scrutiny and oversight of video, as well as the protections from robbery or burglaries with video and alarms. Um, we heard a lot of testimony that those um, 
two sections were particularly onerous and expensive to cultivators who are not required to have video and video surveillance and alarm systems on their cultivation site. Um, it's my understanding, and, and hopefully CDFA will speak more to it, but the um, security provisions for cultivation largely are established by local jurisdictions. That's correct. We don't have any uh, security requirements for cultivate. I mean, not for video requirements for security um, for cultivators. Okay, thank you. Just a quick comment um, to clarify. You're talking about transport for the purposes of processing and to a manufacturing facility and a distributor and to a lab for pretesting? That is correct. Okay, public comment. Okay, so we're gonna be taking public comment on the current motion that's on the floor, which is regarding cultivators to accept number six, number seven, and number 11 as currently written. And just a reminder that all the other statutory uh, recommendations will go to our Oakland meeting. So please queue up and uh, remember to make your questions in the form of a comment. All right, first up. Good morning. Uh, my name is Virgil Grant. Uh, <clears throat> I am co-founder of California Minority Alliance. I'd like to speak towards uh, the recommendation of the uh, A&M, uh, recommendation number six. And my recommendation is that the uh, A&M should not even exist with the cultivator. It's the same product. Uh, it also puts an undue stress on the cultivator to have to uh, uh, financially would uh, undo stress financially on the cultivator that they would have to carry two systems in one site to grow the same product. It should be determined on the retail end. And me as a retail owner, I would like to be able to purchase my product from a cultivator and as a cultivator as well, like to purchase my product from other cultivators without them determining whether it's gonna be adult or medical. Let the market, the consumer in, determine A and M on a retail perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, next up. Well, good afternoon. It is after 12. My name is Gregory McGarrian, uh, state licensed and locally licensed micro business here in Los Angeles. And uh, I've had a unique perspective because I've had to deal with everything. And so I have a grow in our garage 15 feet from our retail store. I don't want to have to identify between medical, and we have both licenses, adult and medical, at that point from the time I'm going to move it from my garage to the store, which is 15 feet away. That doesn't make sense. And if we're talking about quality and taxes, and from what I've seen, the only difference between A and M is the taxes, which comes at the point of sale. No, it shouldn't be at the beginning because the quality of the product should remain the same whether it's medical or adult use. That's my comment. Thank you, Thank you very much. All right, next up. Ron Edwards. I'm going to take this back to the beginning from a nursery. Um, at the nursery level, there's a shortage of nurseries already. There's only 100 and some registered. Um, and for us to have a perishable product, there's no tax implication at that level. It is just strictly a plant. And if we have a customer that has placed an order, uh, for some reason can't pick that up, it's been designated, we've lost that material. And again, there's a shortage of clones available. Um, so it's very important, particularly at the nursery level, to have that justification at the time. If it has to be, when it's sold. But again, at the cultivation is the level where that taxation comes into play. Um, number two, on the, number 11, um, transport. Um, it's kind of tied into the nursery issue. It's very vital that we open that up. In the original regulations, the nurseries were able to transport um, as far as being able to keep the quality um, of the material. Um, we don't have a very high value product at that time, so all of these security issues um, are really overwhelming at this point. Um, so if you could relax that, and, and I really support that issue. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up. Hi, uh, I'm, my name is Greg Minkoff. I'm a member of WAM. I've been a member for 11 years. 
I just want to remind the, the committee here that in the beginning of this whole process, when, pro, when 215 was passed, the founder of our organization, Valerie Corral and Michael Corral, were out uh, putting themselves on the line for people who needed medical help. Not, not to make money on this thing, not to uh, you know, raise uh, revenue for the state. It was about helping people who were in pain, people who were dying, people like myself who have a chronic condition that I've suffered since I've been 12. I'm a teacher, a public school teacher. My income is capped. I don't have uh, uh, discretionary funds as the product gets taxed ten, uh, four and five times the value. Um, we pay in WAM $5 a gram as a, a, a to donation toward the uh, production of the product. And I'm hoping that you keep the medical uh, concerns uh, at a set aside, separate for the small uh, com compassion groups and set us aside from the profit making uh, endeavors here. Thank you. All right, next up. Uh, good afternoon, Ron Johnson, growlens.com. Simple software to help growers harvest more efficiently uh, while keeping up with compliance. Uh, my comments were in regards to number 11 with self-transport and distribution. Um, I highly recommend you guys allow cultivators to do that. Um, one, because it uh, provides um, security risk. Um, most grow operations want to be autonomous and exclusive. So if you have all these entities coming to pick up product, that can provide um, some additional security uh, risk that growers don't want. Um, and two, it just provides undue stress for the grower. Um, it's a complex thing as it is, and it, it wouldn't really serve anybody to not allow them to transport their own product. So okay. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Randy Lentz. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for your hard work on the committee. Um, I'm on the board of the Adelanto Growers Association, and uh, our group uh, currently holds state licenses for cultivation, processing, and distribution. Two quick comments on the, the motion. Uh, first on number 11, uh, we're in support of that, but I think you might want to clarify or rename it because I, I don't think you're implying it in, uh, allows full-blown distribution all the way to retail. I think what we're talking about is the 15 feet from you know, the garage to the next building or uh, transport uh, to the items listed. So I just wanted to suggest perhaps a clarification on maybe just the labeling of it. Um, second, um, on m and I wanted to add our voice uh, very strongly in support of as much fluidity as you can accomplish between m and and I know we're just talking cultivation now, but um, all the way up through the food chain. Um, in fact, I would even like to have folks, as you're working on this going forward, to consider M slash A. Um, the, the, the flour's the same, the extracts are the same, almost everything is the same for most of the products that hit the shelves until we get to some dosing requirements and who can buy it on the younger ages. Um, and so uh, as much uh, benefit as we can give cultivators, manufacturers, processors, distributors, what have you, to um, transfer back and forth to address market demand, address, uh, address the supply chain management, you know, squarely within the track and trace system or the system as modified to allow this, the better off everyone will be. I don't, I don't think there's any losers in that. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, Ross? Uh, Ross Gordon, California Growers Association. Um, these recommendations are of um, very serious concern uh, to our members. As mentioned previously, we have 1,300 members. Um, those folks uh, are interested, good faith, in coming into compliance. Um, many are, are not able to or having uh, a lot of difficulty doing that um, because of, of difficulty with some of these um, regulations, which I think the, the regulations that uh, y'all have moved on are, are very important and we do uh, support all of them. Uh, particularly with respect to the transfer between A and M, um, we're concerned that there could be really serious market chaos with oversupply in some markets and undersupply in others. Um, if this uh, current grace period, uh, the last until July 1st, allowing transfers between those two is not extended, um, given that that is the current, current grace period, it seems that it, it must be authorized by statute since it is the current policy. Um, so we would support an extension of that as contained in the motion. Um, we also strongly support making transport more accessible. Um, many of our members are having a lot of problems moving product off farm. Full service distributors are typically not equipped to perform that sort of function. And, and so making the transport license more accessible is important to that. 
Um, finally, I uh, think the committee should take a look at the lab testing and nursery recommendations. The comment from CDFA is that they may violate statute. Um, I think parts of those certainly don't violate statute. Um, and would also hope in general that it's, it's possible to provide public comment on things that are removed from consideration if those are subcommittee recommendations. Seems like that's something that, that the committee should hear. Lab testing and nursery recommendations, super important. They fall within statute partially. Thanks. Thank you. All right, next step. Susan Tibbon, Lovingly and Legally, founding member of California Growers Association. Regarding transport by cultivators, um, please, please keep in mind that for rural growers, rural farmers, we're looking at $50 and up per hour to pick up transport material. Uh, it's yet another barrier to adoption. Regarding transfer between A&M licenses, horticulturally, these are all the same plants, and the distinction uh, seems arbitrary and frankly punitive. It also doesn't foster what Greg was talking about. Uh, cannabis uh, with the CBD-rich plants, uh, they're, ver they're smaller, they're more fragile, and we want to promote those strains. Uh, the Charlotte's Web, which is an ACDC, which we grow. So thank you for, for considering the, the horticultural nature of these plants. And finally, um, as a farmer of many decades, uh, global warming is having a huge effect. Uh, we all can get our strawberries at Safeway or Whole Foods, but um, our strawberries are suffering. Uh, we're seeing differences in chill hours, and we're seeing these problems manifest in our cannabis plants as well. So please keep that in mind as you regulate. Please give us latitude and flexibility. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we'll go to the gentleman at the end, yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chief Ajax, committee members. My name is Dan Georgiatis, lawyer in the Bay Area. I represent Purple Lotus Patient Center operating in San Jose. Uh, we have various adult use and medical licenses uh, with the state. I, I just want to remind the committee members the, the Business and Professions Code mandate in 26,013 uh, that, that these regulations be commercially feasible. Um, the, the market will go to, to the efficiencies, and we're seeing the medical market sort of being pushed out right now. Uh, it's not a good development uh, for the least of which reasons is the federal government protects uh, state compliant medical cannabis businesses. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to poke the elephant there, but that, that's the truth. So uh, I think there, there may be something you can do, though, uh, about the A and the M issue here. Uh, we, we can perhaps uh, section uh, 8,214 in the cultivation regulations, you can extend the transition period until January 1, 2020 and allow the, legislat the legislature to uh, have an, uh, a legislative fix. That will give them some time. Uh, I do not agree with recommendation 11, anything to lessen security. Uh, Purple Lotus is, is not for. Um, and thank you. Thank you. Hello there, I'm Candace Haas, founder and director of Orange County Normal, a consumer advocacy organization, here talking about the compassionate use programs um, as an advocacy organization, besides the tax rates altogether. The thing I hear most about is about the compassionate programs providing free medicine to veterans seriously ill. And we do support um, amendment number seven, but we would also like to suggest that not only an incentive, but tax relief would be appropriate for these organizations providing free medicine. Also a separate category for growers that only want to provide free medicine. And that also um, home growers wanting to provide free medicine have a, a, a way to do that as well. We also want to um, express that our concern that the track and trace system would be ready for this other um, licensing scheme or tax rate. And also, I've heard a lot of concern about people having to get their ID card from the state to get compassionate use of med medical marijuana without a fee. A lot of people have children or they work for the government or something, and they don't want to register with the database. So that would be another one of our suggestions. But we do thank you for your hard work. Thanks so much. Next up. Hi. My name is O. Uh, I represent a small boutique farmer um, group that's been you know, providing uh, medicine for the last couple years. And, we're trying to become compliant. There's very many, many financial barriers, especially if you haven't been operating for profit, if you've been trying to help people this whole time, all of a sudden you're having to come up with millions of dollars. It's, 
It's, ex it's extremely hard to get into this marketplace. There's a lot of illusion of inclusion, um, especially with, um, <sighs> man, I can go on for this. Um, th keep the medical, please. Like, it, there's a lot of, the poor and sick is who's gonna suffer and is suffering right now. And that's what I wanna touch on is the, the compassionate care program. People don't have the skill to grow the, the, the quality medicine that they have for themselves. One person cannot grow enough for, you know, for five people. That's, that's it's ridiculous. The six plant limit is ridiculous. If you, if you don't wanna get high, if you wanna juice your plants, that's what, you got enough for a week? So um, I know that's not what we're talking about now, but to me it all ties in together with the compassionate care programs. And please, I urge you do not just turn this into a for-profit industry. There's a lot of sick, poor people that are suffering because of it, so. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, Sunshine Lunch Show. Uh, this comment applies to all discussion around the AM license type across other recommendations. Specifically, I'm addressing recommendation six, but I will not return for those other discussion items. I just want to echo what other people have said. If the concern is accessibility to the medical market, the medicinal market, is it important that you do not uh, curtail the supply chain at the very outset? The underlying authority, the statutory authority on which this decision is based is actually arguable. You do not have to trace a unique identifier according to the actual license type but the licensee. Secondly, you have a mandate to make sure, as my predecessor uh, observed, that these are commercially feasible reg re uh, regulations such that a reasonably prudent business person would not be deterred from entering the commercial marketplace. I think it's really important that we're in Los Angeles today because we can see what has happened uh, with people wanting to enter the, commercially, the commercial marketplace and being able to have clarity as to when we need to designate something that is taxed consistently throughout the system until retail as ARM is really important for people who are transitioning in or continuing on to the annual license process. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up. Hi, Emma Snugs with the California Cannabis Industry Association speaking on behalf of CCIA's Agricultural Committee. Um, I'd like to speak to recommendation number six. While we greatly appreciate the opportunity for cultivators to hold both A&M licenses on the same premises, we remain concerned that the restrictions around commingling A&M plant material could lead to surplus in the A or M supply chain while shortages exist in the other. The draft emergency regulations require that cultivators declare plant material as A or M material upon entering the plant oh, excuse me, <laughs> upon entering the plant material into the track or trace system. Furthermore, it appears that cultivators holding both A and M licenses will be required to have separate track and trace software for each license. As proposed, this framework is overly restrictive as well as costly. We strongly urge the state to allow cultivators holding both A and M licenses to sell all cannabis plant material into either the A or M market without identifying the plant material as A or M. Cannabis and cannabis-derived products should be available to both A and M licensed processors, manufacturers, distributors, etc. Through the entry into the retail space. Cannabis and cannabis derived products should not have to be identified as A or M product until it is sold again at the retail level. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up. Hi, Alexis D'Angelo with the California Cannabis Industry Association. Um, when it comes to compassionate use, we support compassionate use programs and the value they bring to patients over, all over the state. We're willing to be a resource in finding a solution to ending the absorbent taxes and erroneous fees and unnecessarily burden these programs. Thanks so much. Thank Jackie McGowan, K Street Consulting. Um, I have concerns with the A and M, M uh, grace period. Uh, the recommendation in front of you today or right now requires a statutory change, but the ones that are before you later this afternoon do not. Uh, a six-month grace period would allow this market to settle, and currently 33% of the state is regulating both the M and A markets. Only 18% of those uh, are, have, have regulated adult use, and so there is going to be a mismatch throughout the supply chain, and there is currently a mismatch in the supply chain. Uh, dispensaries are currently sitting on medical product that they cannot move. And uh, this is probably going to get worse, and we could actually see this market completely wiped out if we don't extend this at least six months. Um, and uh, I represent a Facebook group, California City and County Regulation Watch. We have 6,300 members. 
uh, ranging from patients to professionals and all across the board. And our number one concern is the Compassion Use Program. Uh, I, I'm going to echo what a previous speaker just said. There was, there's an illusion of inclusion of patients in this process. <laughs> and we need to change that. Compassion is, where, is what we have built the foundation of this industry on, and we need to include patients back in this process. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> All right, uh, next up. Hi, Paul Hansbury, Lovingly and Legally, um, speaking for the small farmer. Um, the Compassion Use Program, um, obviously there's a lot of small cottage farmers that are uh, doing this for themselves and for others. Um, there was a, a minor detail that was uh, lobbied during the, statute, the statutory process for uh, cottage farmers, and uh, that was for the 25 plants. I know that's for number four. But the reason for that was because the definitions for, um, for a, a, uh, a the, the canopy was different. The, the definition of the canopy has changed for definable space instead of the whole grow area. So the, that, but they lobby because the small farmer would have, you know, corn and strawberries and things in their garden. They would, they could apply locally for 2,500 square feet of cultivation, but they would have to get a half an acre from the state because of the definition of canopy. That's changed, but the, the 25 plant limit is still there on state level, and they need to be able to change that. So it, it's a minor detail on, a, on the state level, but for the small cottage farmer, it's a big deal so that they can get eight, 25 plants is 800 square feet. Um, I, and I uh, support also the, that the uh, A&M designation should only be at the retail level. The, the, you know, it's the same plant. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Hello, my name is Jem Montez. I'm the founder and director of Inland Empire Normal, and I'd like to speak on six and seven and the M&A designation. Um, as it does impose a burden on cultivators at this time, I do agree as well that it should be at the retail level. I also feel with the growers transitioning to the legal market and navigating through compliance, we want to leverage our supply and be as proactive as possible when it comes to fulfilling the market demands. Um, and if we can designate m and I think we should be able to designate for um, our patients a tax exempt, exempt, exempt status, excuse me. Uh, I think it would be just as simple. We can call it E. Um, and we should be able to provide um, the donated product, the cultivator with the donated product credits that they deserve. And, in regard to the nursery, please give them your attention as everything that we're doing begins with the plant. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up. Hi, I'm Stephanie Hopper with Condescent and um, wanted to speak about the a and um, One of the issues that I don't think is being addressed is the cost of the state to audit the program. Um, when you have an a and m you're going in and you're now doing two audits instead of one. When you're looking at a plant that is growing next to each other and the only difference is a blue tag versus a yellow tag, uh, the only difference is at the retail level when you're looking at medical products that are higher dosage for specifically for those medical patients. Um, Washington State has a program that is functioning this way. The metric system is set up to track it appropriately and their point of sales are already set up to unlock those um, products and give medical patients a lower tax rate. I think that that would be wise to take a look at that. Um, and then on self-transport distribution, um, I would like to say, you know, you created the processor license, so let's let people use it. Thank you. All right, next up. Hello, I'm Ben Reed with uh, Cannabuild. We, we operate a compassionate use program for low-income patients, and um, our number one priority is health and safety. Um, I think it's been, I want to reiterate, like, what many people have been saying here. The current state of our compassionate use program is a public health emergency. And if that cannot be a priority, then I don't want nothing to do with this industry. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, that concludes public comment. OK, we have a motion on the ta table. Uh, any other comments? Seeing. Can we read the motion? Yes, sir. The motion on the table is to adopt or approve recommendations six, seven, and 11 in the, from the Subcommittee on Cultivators. 
I have a few comments. Um, one is that this is obviously really a complex thing in front of us. Uh, there is no doubt that, that horticulturally things are the same between this plant and that plant, uh, no matter which direction they're going. The implications, I think, is that we're getting to the point where um, the only difference between A and M is that people with a medical card will get um, the a reduction in the excise tax at the retail. Um, the difficulty that that entails is uh, that we have statutory and I think important uh, laws saying that health claims cannot be made for uh, adult use marijuana. But when there's no distinction between the two except for the fact that the medicinal um, patient doesn't have to pay the excise tax, we're going to have a great deal of difficulty with uh, controlling uh, medical claims as part of advertising for, um, for adult use. Um, I'm also not clear uh, in terms of the safety for the, the farmers, because I'm not a policeman here, I, I just don't understand this, is uh, how safe it is, uh, whether or not he, uh, enough um, regulations can be made that, that maintain the safety of this transport. Um, and what makes this all so complex is that if we can reduce the cost uh, and, and therefore increase the profit to the, to the farmers, we will also be protecting our ability to keep the excise tax at the level that it is so that we can be feeding it into the, uh, the accounts that, for which it's designated. So I'm not sure I'm able to, to make a vote on this at this point. Well, I want to add a couple of things. Oh, excuse me. I, I wanted to um, also indicate that I'm terribly confused because I thought the A&M had some specific implications at the grow level while you're making that designation. And I'm sure it, it must be in statute. It wasn't in the initiative. And so if it was placed in statute through the Bureau, Maybe somebody can tell somebody who, who doesn't grow, who doesn't understand farming, why we have this distinction being made uh, at, at the grow level. I, I don't understand. I'm listening to the testimony, and I want to vote. Well, I want to vote the right way. So somebody needs to explain something to me. To add a couple of comments, on the health claims, you can't make the health claims regardless if it's MRA. Um, you still you have the FDA that's out there anyway on the difference between the products, between M and A, it comes down to two things. It's intent of the use and the tax that goes with it. So if there was a consolidation of M and A or if the whole M and A thing wasn't there, now you're dealing on a macro level with one supply level that gets rerouted based on consumer demand without having to guess what the market demand is going to be six months out. So. And then um, just a quick point of clarification. the. Um, the only tax difference between um, A and M is not in reference to the excise tax, but a patient who holds a state card um, is eligible to not pay the sales, the local and state sales tax on that product. All cannabis consumers, whether they're medical or adult use, are subject to the cultivation and the 15% excise. Okay, any other uh, comments? All right, seeing none. May I, okay. may I say one more thing? I, I apologize, this is taking a long time, but just, just about the security components. Um, I think it, I just want to express that I think there's wisdom in allowing um, the cultivation security to be um, set by the local jurisdiction and municipality. Um, reason for that is what security needs might look like in a very rural setting. Um, where you're, you know, basically in the middle of nowhere are really different for a cultivation facility that would be urban-based. And so um, I don't, I don't, I really don't necessarily agree that what we're proposing under 11 would pose security risks because potentially the local jurisdiction could add any um, foreseeable security needs that were relevant in that area. Okay, can we have a roll call, please?
Bobolian? Aye. Cermak? Abstain. Clifford? Aye. Dombrowski? Aye. Faro? Aye. Heidelback Terramoto? Abstain. Harada? Abstain. Huffman? Abstain. Jacobson? Nevidal? Aye. Nikita? No. Peck? Aye. Ron? Aye. Stevenson? Aye. Sweeney? Stain. Todd? Aye. Woolsey? Nay. Wu? Stain. You? Aye. The motion passes. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Eight. Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. I wasn't trying to kill the motion, but I was hoping that uh, we would do something more on an emergency basis since it seems to be such a complicated issue. And um, putting it off to the next meeting didn't seem to be the solution that was more appropriate, uh, most appropriate to the testimony that we heard. And so having abstained and the motion passed, I suppose I can't do anything on either side because I lost my vote. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm thinking that there's a possibility that somebody could move for emergency legislation. Well, I'll make that motion. Oh, well, hang on, hang on a second. Um, <clears throat> We're going to just try and keep things in a little bit of uh, propriety here. Um, we need to get some legal advice on, on, you know, where our authority begins and ends on, on some of these motions. So hang on just a moment. Okay, I can speak to that issue, at least from a legal perspective. So the Bureau obviously um, can't take, does not have legislative authority. If the committee wanted to, as a committee, act and, you know, make, send a letter or make some sort of recommendation yes. to the legislature, you could do that. Um, the committee would, of course, have to act as a whole. Um, so you could do that. The Bureau itself and the other licensing authorities, though, we don't have any jurisdiction um, over legislation. So would I be able to amend my motion and request the committee to put out an emergency recommendation, um, considering that it passed to whichever body is appropriate to? Just one quick note on that, too. So if the committee does vote to do that, you'll also have to in your vote determine who on the committee would either draft that letter or, or put that forth to the legislature um, and give them the power to do that if the language of, if the letter isn't here for you to approve or disprove or deal with that at another meeting. Um, and of course, keep in mind that any communications with the legislature would have to be done in such a way that you do not violate the rules for Bagley Keen. So you'd be, have to be very careful about who who, who all is involved with that um, so that you're not having any sort of serial meeting or any meeting that's not open to the public? I'd, I'd also add that, yeah, you, can, you don't have to amend. You can just create a new motion at this point. Um, but I'd, I'd add that, you know, we've already gone through only two sections so far. Um, and, and I think, you know, out of a lot of these, there's going to be some, some priorities that are legislative items. And, and my understanding, and we can maybe deal with this at the end of, of the day, 
is is those those items are you know the ones we are pulling we we recognize as priorities so you know at the end of the day if we want to bundle all of those together rather than dealing with each uh, section on its own if we want to bundle all of those together and say here's the here's the priority recommendations or things that were identified by the subcommittees you know as a whole then we can do that at the end um, uh, I understand that part, but part of the conversation earlier today was that there are certain recommendations that are higher priority because of planning season, because of legislative uh, sessions expiring prior to the next subcommittee hearing. And this is a, one of those topics where we have spent a lot of time talking about it. We have gone pretty much the first half of the day. We're only on the second agenda item, but at the same time, it is probably one of those items that has the highest level of uh, concern as far as the public's concerned, as far as the industry is concerned. And, all around, I mean, we probably took the most amount of public comment on that. If it comes down to us being able to put together a recommendation on an emergency uh, last minute basis and submit it prior to, um, I think we kind of owe it to the public to do so, even if it takes a little more time. So, so be clear, so what, what are your priorities then? The priority is on the m and designation, uh, being at the cultivation level, uh, keep in mind understanding that it is statutory and the outcome is uncertain, but the motion would be for this committee to put together a recommendation to amend the m and designation and submit that to whichever appropriate legislative body would be um, prior to the next subcommittee hearing. Okay, is that so a motion? <laughs> I second it. I have a, I'm, I'm sorry, I have a comment. Member Nikita. So I voted no on, on the last, you have to excuse my voice. I voted no on the last item primarily with concerns over number 11, although supportive of the other two. Uh, but I would feel uncomfortable delegating the authority to an individual to make a representation on behalf of the entire subcommittee given the way the voting, uh, the entire committee, given the way the voting actually shaped out. Uh, you know, there wasn't 23 eyes on, on this floor. And so I'd have some concerns at, at doing that. So if, if this is a motion and it has been seconded, those are the concerns that I would state. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Yeah, just for clarification, it was my understanding that the, that the chair of the committee would bring forward the priorities. And from, from those priorities, we would have a vote. And, and understanding that those priorities would then, however we do it, that was suggested by council, go to the legislature before they, um, aren't in session. So I'm thinking that's what you were doing, correct? With these th three priorities, or you have identified five, six, and 11, is it? Or no, six, seven, and 11. Is, is, that, is, is that my understanding? Because maybe I'm incorrect. I think that the discussion was that you guys would talk about them. Um, I don't think there was a motion or anything that specifically stated that these would be going forward to the legislature by a certain person and a certain method and a certain time. Um, I think that's something that if that's the committee's wish, you would have to, to take that next step to um, figure out if, if that means these things go to the legislature now. and. Who on the committee is going to be responsible for doing that? Uh, Madam, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I thought there was a motion after that explanation that we pull out the A and M and try to get emergency legislation to correct that one item that seemed to be causing so many consternations and problems out in the field. And uh, if the Bureau can't carry legislation, I know the agency can, but our chairman can if we had a majority vote because it's a democratic process. And so uh, anyone could, on behalf of the committee, if the committee so chose, take the legislation over to the people that are drafting it today and get this emergency uh, item included in the legislation going on today. Right, and, and all I'm... Uh... Come on now, you're just delaying lunch. Um, so, so now, uh, relax. Excuse me. We're not going to tolerate outbursts at the meeting. Thank you. So my recommendation earlier was I understand what you're saying, but these top priorities are likely to emerge in other subcommittee recommendations. 
And so what I'd like to see is that we deal with them as a whole. So this is one of those that we could bring up uh, toward the end. And if we can come up with a consensus, rather than having six different messages that are brought forward to the legislature, there's probably multiple items that are going to emerge as top priorities by this committee. Um, and so my recommendation was, if, if just as sort of a friendly recommendation, that we table your motion just for, for this one item, keep it you know, on, on, the, on your top of the list, and when we get through other subcommittees, we bundle all of these as one recommendation back to the legislature with consensus. Recognizing what was said earlier, that not everybody's going to agree on every one of these items, that's fine. And so we could either, at the end of the day, deal with them on a one-by-one -one basis or bundle them all together and see what message is brought forward by this committee. Um, but, you know, in, in the, uh, you know, anyway, that's just my recommendation is that we do it that way. If we want to do it separately, it's, you know, it's up to the will of the committee. But, uh, you know, I'd, uh, I'd prefer to be able to come, come up with more of a consensus throughout the day. I support the chair's uh, suggestion, and I think uh, perhaps if the chair and the vice chair would work together with uh, the subcommittee chairs to bundle together. Oh, we can't do that. That's going to be a Bagley Keene issue. So we need to address that today. You know, so as those recommendations come forward, this is one of those that we should add to the list and uh, bundle those by the end of today. Uh, Chairman, taking that into consideration, I will table towards the end of the meeting. Um, considering that it is going to be brought up again, we'll take everything and I'll reintroduce the motion at the end of the meeting. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm not trying to delay lunch. I have to leave, and I'm hoping that um, this particular item will pass later this evening and that we don't run out of time at the end of the evening and say, well, we can't get it done, we're out of time. So I'm going to trust your chairmanship to make sure that that doesn't happen. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think it's a timely issue. So now we need to make, uh, absolutely, and, and we're, we're definitely going to keep track of all of these issues throughout the day. Um, my goal is, you know, hopefully in, in some level of efficiency, we're able to get through all, all of these uh, by the end of, uh, of the day if we can. Um, but uh, uh, in, in the interest of time, we have a choice to make, and, and uh, uh, we either break for lunch now or we go on to the next section. The next section is relatively short in comparison, so if we have the, uh, if we have the ability, we can do that, or we can uh, take a brief uh, break. And go ahead. Anyone? Members? Are we good to I would, I would, on? I would appreciate a brief break, frankly. Brief break. I'd appreciate it if we could go ahead. All right. Well, somebody can make a motion. That would be wonderful. Yes, I'd like to make a motion uh, that we no, proceed. Motion, can we? Uh, all right. Are we, in, are we in consensus? Anyone else? Let's just continue. All right. So item number, uh, let's see. Moving on, uh, subcommittee on distributors. Um, if we could have a report from the uh, chairperson of the subcommittee, please. On the distribution, we met twice, and these are the recommendations. One of the biggest concerns was selling of samples and the distributor being allowed to um, take a sample, transport a sample, uh, sell a sample to the retailer. The specific recommendation is bureau should address how, if at all, licensees may provide samples for a nominal fee, both for B and B, and for B to B to C situations. Uh, staff comments: recommendation would allow licensees to provide samples of cannabis and cannabis goods to other licensees, which are not intended for retail sale. Uh, pricing decisions are considered the business decision that is left to licensees to determine. So currently, the way it stands is uh, samples are provided at one cent uh, a penny to get around to giving it away for free. So this recommendation would uh, ask for more clarity on that. Uh, recommendation number two is an additional label. In addition to all the rights and responsibilities afforded to a licensee regarding packaging and labeling, how a distributor would be allowed to apply an additional label to the final product if the final product's test results are inconsistent with the existing printed results, variations within a 10% range. Uh, staff comments on this were uh, currently section 5303 of the Bureau's regulations provide an overview. 
This section prohibits distributors from packaging and or labeling manufactured cannabis products except when the distributor also, hold, also holds a manufacturing license. This recommendation would enable distributors to relabel a package for other cannabinoids. There's a little bit of inconsistency in that it's not uh, to authorize the distributor to uh, repackage without a manufacturing license. This is in the event where a manufacturer produces a product, um, packages it, labels it, sends it to a distributor, distributor sends it out for the laboratory test. When the results come back, if they're inconsistent with what is uh, printed on the label, the distributor to be allowed to affix an additional sticker on top of it to prevent, to not have to destroy the product, and that would be at the discretion and approval of the manufacturer. <coughs> recommendation number three, which would also address uh, one of the recommendations in the cultivation sector, cultivation subcommittee, this recommendation is for storage-only center licenses. Create a subcategory license under distribution designated as a storage-only center that is allowed to hold inventory and transport product. This, the transactional portion would remain with the full distribution license. Now, this is not to say that the uh, satellite locations would not require dual licensing. You would still require dual licensing. Um, you would need a local license and a state license. But not each license doesn't have to be a full-blown distribution license. You have one that's a distributor. The rest of them would function as storage only, transport only. So you can move the product um, throughout the state. When you conduct a transaction, the transaction would go under the license number of the main license. And recommendation number four is the trans uh, transition period extension. Currently, there's a six-month uh, transition period. Because a lot of the cities, the majority of the cities in the state are very behind in licensing, because a lot of the operations are not fully established, um, six months is not enough time, and we highly encourage the Bureau to extend the six-month transition period and make it a full 12 months. Okay, any, uh, any comments from the uh, committee? Yeah, uh, Woolsey, I do have a question in regards to recommendation number two uh, for the distributor to be allowed to apply an additional label, just to confirm that that additional label would be consistent with the test results that came back, correct? Correct. And that's primarily because of some of the stuff we touched on earlier today with the inconsistency with laboratory testing. You can send out the same batch of product to the same lab five times, you'll probably get five different results, and a lot of times they're within a small variation. Mm -hmm. So instead of having to destroy the product, send it back to the manufacturer, adding it to additional packaging and labeling cost, the majority of the time this is something as simple as a printed label, uh, a sticker with the actual, uh, with the final, whichever one is considered the uh, final results to go on there. <laughs> okay, any others? Okay, so on I'm, the... I'm curious, I'm sorry, I'm oh. curious about whether or not that, that additional label would cover the manufacturer's label, which then would have an, an inaccurate information, or would it be next to it? It would be going on top of it. For instance, you have a product, you send it out for testing. Uh, the product packaging has it stated 22% uh, THC, for example. It comes back something different. The additional label that the distributor would be able to affix would really be a sticker. It's probably going to make the package look ugly, but that's at the discretion and the decision of the manufacturer to make whether or not they want to relabel it or if they want the distributor to provide a temporary band-aid and affix the label over. Okay, so can we get a motion then? Um, I would like to make a motion to adopt all the regulations, uh, all the recommendations, the uh, one through Four that are regulatory. Second. All right, first and a second by Mr. Sweeney. Uh, public comment. Good morning, Chair, ladies and Chair, gentlemen. Um, just real quick. Oh, sorry, did I interrupt? Uh, okay, yeah. So I'm sorry, we have a few disabled veterans that um, weren't able to make it up in time on the last agenda item, and I'd like to, uh, Chair, ask if we could just allow one of them to speak on behalf of all of them very quickly. Oh, absolutely. Okay, yeah. please go ahead. I'm going to ask my uh, gentleman to my left and right and behind me to introduce himself by name, rank, and what they do, and then I'm going to speak for the group. Good afternoon. My name is John Adams. I'm a disabled U.S. Marine veteran. I am the president of the Weed for Warriors Project Inland Empire. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Robert Angaro. I am an Afghanistan veteran, and I'm here to discuss. I'm the Orange County chapter president. 
Myself, I'm Brandon Lopez, U.S. Army retired, OEF, OIF combat veteran, um, here to advocate um, with uh, We for Warrior Project Inland Empire chapter. I'm a board member there, where we advocate for safe use of medical cannabis for veterans like myself. My name is Sean Kernan, and I'm just an ordinary grunt. I'll tell you uh, the discussion I just saw, so I think this quote fits it perfectly. In times of moral crisis, the hottest place in hell is preserved for those who stay neutral. And I'm paraphrasing Dante's Inferno and John F. Kennedy's favorite quote. Veterans have been disenfranchised. The voters in the state of California just disenfranchised a lot of sick and disabled veterans and non-veterans alike. We need a road to re-enfranchise those we have left behind. Those recommendations that are on this are but a small part of what needs to be done, but they are so important, and let me tell you why. They are important because they show government, the state of California, can listen and do the right thing for those that don't have millions of dollars needed to affect change. And let me tell you what I fear. I fear the consequences if you do not act. The state of California declared war on the sick and disabled and the veterans of this state. How long until common sense leads these common people to declare war on the state of California? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we are currently um, have a motion on the floor with regards to the distributors subcommittee and it's to adopt the recommendations one through four in regard to the regulations. So if the first three folks could come and sit at the table, we'll move through public comment. And um, we'll start with the gentleman on the, the left, please. Um, Tim Orland, River Distributing. <laughs> Sorry, Susan. Uh, <laughs> definitely in favor of uh, the distributors being able to relabel the products with the actual correct <laughs> test result the test result that will actually place this product into the retail market. Um, I don't want to repeat my comments from, from later or, or from previous comments, but uh, we're dealing with this situation. The lab results are, are, are different, um, most of them. Uh, so that's a huge issue. Uh, definitely in favor of the A&M, being able to extend that grace period. Uh, and the um, different license types for a cross docking facility. Um, this is going to happen a lot with distributors. We're going to want to have a main facility, and then you're going to have a separate facility. Uh, so we're in Northern California, so we'll want one in Southern California where we can cross dock our material, uh, not store it there, literally drive it down and put it into smaller trucks and then distribute it to retailers in Southern California. That's all we want. We don't want a place where we actually store product. Uh, it's just the physical place where the product transfers to different trucks. So thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. And next up. Good afternoon. My name is Tyrone Freeman, and I serve as the executive director for the California Minority Alliance. And welcome to Southern California. I want to give a general overview in our response to regulations before you vote in regards to distribution. It is our, it is our belief that uh, distributors should not have carte blanche um, um, authority within the supply chain process of cannabis. So one of the things we would have to factor in is you, before you make your vote is if you allow for distributors to conch blanche, have storage facilities, then you have a negative impact on those who have a micro business in those geographical areas and actually have distributing as a part of the micro business. So the question becomes how do we stop the monopolization of the actual centerpiece core process of the supply chain, which would inevitably put those who are depending on a supply chain below that sector at the discretionary perspective of those who are in control with resources of distributors. So that's one perspective, I think, and would recommend that the committee hold this for further analysis. The second point that I would like to raise is, again, you are giving conch blanche authority to a distributor in regards to monopolizing the market by allowing them to relabel it without a circular path of the relabeling going back to certified or be verified of the product being labeled by a 
lab before it goes to the market. You're giving, again, conch blanche support to a distributor, minus any other supply chain impact and pricing avenues. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up. Uh, good afternoon. With regards to samples, uh, Susan Tibbon, with regard to samples, the only way for patients to find out about effective but very small production, topicals for instance, is by trying a sample. Um, we need to be able to survive in what's looking an awful, like, awful lot like big pharma and agribusiness. Dispensaries and patients in the Bay Area have told us over and over again that they don't want to be or in a Walmart of pot. They've told us they want to have unique artisanal products and that's what we do, but we, we need to be able to continue to do that. In terms of the transition period, absolutely. Uh, in stock items uh, have not been sold. They have already been taxed. They should allow, we should allow them to be sold. And to echo um, the man who just spoke, uh, both my father-in-law, who s was the only survivor of his LST, um, had his transition greatly eased for the last three years of his life. It's one of the ways that we learned about cannabis as medicine, as has my husband, who served two tours in Vietnam. So um, people have told us to not be too emotional or personal, but for many of, this, of, of us, uh, this is very personal, as well as wanting to contribute to the economy of our counties and state. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next step. Uh, I, okay, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, my name is Gregory McGarrion, uh, U.S. Marine Corps veteran, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Iraq. Uh, number two, number three, number four, and number five, I'm going to agree and uh, support uh, the Bureau uh, as far as uh, protecting our local distributors and not allowing, like the gentleman said, carte blanche for distributors to become these giant monopolies. Uh, I want to go into further detail about uh, recommendation number one, the free sampling. As a veteran, for over a decade now, I've been supporting and helping my local veterans, my brothers and sisters. And just last week, we had an event at the Van Nuys State Building, and uh, it was, uh, you know, support, freedom through support. And uh, for over a decade, we've been giving samples and helping our veterans that are less fortunate and to help them with their PTSD, TBI. And you know, we go off site somewhere, we all hang out, we, we have a smoke, a smoke, and I don't know how many of you know about combat veterans, but we're not very open people. We don't communicate, we don't discuss our feelings. You know, they say, hey, this is the smallest violin in the world, right? Dry ice, suck it up, here's a straw. Well, those problems need to be let out, and cannabis is a key tool into allowing veterans, combat veterans, to express those emotions, let them out. So we really need to be able to provide free cannabis to our veterans as medicinal, because the suicide rate is going through the door for veterans. Thank you. All right, next step. Good afternoon, committee members. My name is Vera Levitt Casey. I am Chief Compliance Officer for Mankind Cooperative in San Diego. I have a very specific request for a friendly amendment on recommendation number three. Currently, Regulation 5301 for storage-only services allows for distributors to provide storage-only services for every licensee de designation with the exception of retailers. The request is for a friendly amendment to add retailers to that list on this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up. Thank you. Max Piccolos with K Street Consulting on behalf of Flo Kana and behalf of the California Cannabis Delivery Alliance. Um, with regards, uh, they are both in support of all four recommendations. They do want to echo and agree with the friendly amendment to recommendation number three to allow storage only services for um, licensed retailers. Um, furthermore, um, it's very appreciative of the transition period extension, the need for relabeling for non THC cannabinoids, and lastly, the belief that the allowing the samples to be sold for a nominal fee. Um, can be a pathway for compassion. So we're very strongly supporting the interpretation of the Bureau of recommendation number one. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right, next up. Stephanie Hopper with Condescent. Um, I wanted to discuss selling samples. Um, I think this is an important piece to helping the regulated market grow 
it's very important for people to get able to get their products out to bud tenders so that bud tenders can get educated about these products and help educate the consumer. Remember, they, they, the bud tender is the last mile to the consumer. They're going to be the ones who are discussing what the products are gonna to do to a person and hopefully going over the label. Um, that means we need to have accurate labels, accurate testing on those labels. That's very, very important for people. Um, storage only um, center, I think this is a very important piece to the distribution. Um, we have labor laws that we need to respect as well. California is a very large state and to cover that um, in a day is very unrealistic. So give companies the ability to have some distribution centers around the state. Another option also with the difficulty we're having with people testing labs is maybe to allow people to move their product to a distribution center closer to labs and allow that being the only other thing that occurs at those centers. Um, and then the transition period, we do support extending that just to keep supporting the recreational or the adult use market. Thank you. All right, next up. Hi there, my name's Alexander Jadani. I'm speaking on behalf of distributors. And I wanted to speak on account number three, the storage only uh, center license. Along the same line that she just spoke on for a distributor, we need a, a roadway and a path to be able to distribute statewide. Uh, legally, safely, whether it's our being able to park at other distributors that are licensed facilities or to have a secured location where we can pull our trucks into, park for the night, stay there, have our like trucks sealed, and then be able to start the next day and go for the rest of distribution. But as she said, it's not currently realistic to be able to transport all over the California state in one day. So we need an ability for our transportation network to do that. Thank you. Hi. Um, Mark Whitlow. Um, I want to, from a testing lab standpoint, I want to talk to about um, uh, testing buds and relabeling them. Um, those sort of things, there are a couple products for which you don't know in advance where your concentration of cannabinoids is going to be. Certainly plants are one. Um, uh, concentrates, extracts can sometimes be in that order. So I think the, uh, the BP, BCC should really consider not having things, having the test done before you label them and that be an option to it and maybe that's part of an amendment to the current one um, and so it's driven by the test and not guessing in advance past history because you just don't know. You'll get a good, good year and a bad year and the THC will differ two, three percent and that's out of spec. So. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll go with the woman on the left. She wants me to go first. Hi, I'm Jackie Subek. I'm a cannabis advocate. Thank you all for being here today. I just want to make a comment on uh, recommendation number one about selling samples. I noticed that this doesn't mention, it does mention that you make a recommendation for B2B and also B2C. So in this case, I want to refer to the B2C part as it relates to events and our event organizer license. I just want to make sure that you think about that because sampling is going to be very, very important at our events. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, next up. Hi, my name is Kate Corson. I work for Okai Logistics um, based in Ukiah. Uh, I just wanted to bring up something that was discussed in the subcommittee about providing a label for B2B samples that um, would say not intended for sale. Um, it's not addressed here and I just, you know, I think we should open up um, the possibility for that because it's, it's really different and, um, you know, it, a lot of retailers and distributors are struggling right now on the sample front. Um, I think that everybody here agrees that this is something that was hugely, um, you know, missed in this whole process. Um, so, so if we can specifically um, address B2B samples more specifically, um, that would be great. And again, you know, even if it's placing a label on something that says not intended for consumers, um, I don't know, you know, why it wasn't included, but uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, that concludes public comment. All right. Thank you. Mr. Bulbouillon, it sounds like uh, there were a number of uh, issues, especially on uh, item number three. Do you care to address any of that? So on item number three, this is 
this was really more intended for the cultivators and the manufacturers than the distributors. Right now, a distributor can only drive so far out where they have to be able to get back home. So if you have a distributor in LA, how does the guy from Humboldt get their product into the LA market when it's, you're talking about one of the biggest markets? For the distributor to set up a distribution center in Humboldt, financially, it's probably not gonna make too much sense. And considering that you have a lot of the cultivation product coming out of Humboldt, there's gotta be some sort of um, accessibility to the entire state market for people that don't have access to it. So uh, earlier in one of the other recommendations for the other subcommittee, there was a comment about, um, and for the life of me, I forgot what that comment was. But there was a comment about the grower in the remote areas being able to house the product off-site uh, the way it stands currently. If you're a cultivator in Humboldt and you grow product and you haven't sold it within your immediate area, you're holding on to that product. If you don't have the space, the safes, the vaults, or the ability to hold on to it, that's what creates the safety issue. Um, to be able to get it down to the LA, to be able to get it down to the San Diego market, the distributor that you would have to rely on would technically have to be a distributor that has multiple primary distribution centers set up. So this doesn't change anything about the way the system's already set up. What it does do is it takes off some of the licensing fees, but it also creates an opportunity for, for instance, um, a collective of growers in the Humboldt area to be able to contract out with the distributor, set up a storage facility uh, under that distributor and be able to house their products over there. So think of it as an offsite vault, think of it as an offsite uh, very much an offsite vault. So now that product can be moved. It doesn't have to go only as far out where it has to go, go back in. So that was the spirit of that recommendation. On the retailer side, we did discuss it in the subcommittee. Um, one, one of the biggest issues that we saw with that was on the retail side, as it is, there is a, um, not a question, but there's, a, uh, there's tension between cultivators and retailers where the cultivator is saying that the retailer is dictating their price and the retailer is saying, I'm the one that's dealing with the uh, headache, I'm the one that's dealing with the taxes, this is what I do. Now if you allow for storage facilities for, to be accessed by the dispensaries, you also create an opportunity for bigger businesses to be able to stock up on product, sit on that product and phase out the market, uh, block out certain uh, market participants. So that was the reason why the retailer was not included as part of the uh, storage hub, and there was one more on there. Uh, the additional label. The additional label recommendation number two was not meant for the distributor to be able to relabel or repackage a product for the manufacturer. It's, for instance, you do your packaging, uh, manufacturers uh, would appreciate this, you order your packaging supplies long before you're gonna need them, sometimes months, sometimes it sits on a ship for months. When you get it, it has certain information that's already printed on there. The intent of Recommendation number two was you're done manufacturing your product, you send it out to the distributor, the distributor sends it out to a lab, your product says it's got, let's say 30% THC in it, the test results come back at 34% THC on it. That product would either be destroyed, rejected, sent back to the manufacturer, the manufacturer would have to incur additional expenses to repackage the product, relabel the product, retest the product, where if it doesn't make sense to the manufacturer, the manufacturer can, dis can instruct the distributor to print out a uh, sticker with the correct percentages per the laboratory results that matter, and then still continue to be able to sell the product. So those are the spirit, that was the spirit of all the different recommendations being made. I'd just like to make a quick clarification for you for, from the legal piece of the regulations. There's nothing in the regulations that would prohibit um, a distributor and transport from doing from stopping, um, they're allowed to take rest breaks, vehicle repair stops, fuel. Um, there is a, a prohibition against leaving a transport vehicle with cannabis or cannabis products unattended in a residential area or parked overnight in a residential area. But you're not prohibited from breaking the trip up in a day or two. Um, the other thing too is distributors right now, they can relabel for the purposes of THC. So if there is a change, they can put that change onto that sticker at the distributor and it wouldn't have to go back to the manufacturer. Um, on the testing, besides the THC, what about the actual laboratory, the contamination levels? It's the no, right now, um, the distributors can only change the THC. So the uh, intent of the, the recommendation was to allow for the testing results if they defer from what's already printed on there to be able to cover it up, be covered up with a sticker on there. And on the uh, logistical timing of it, if you're in Humboldt to get down to the San Diego market, you're not going to San Diego making it back, you're gonna have to uh, park the car. If you park the car overnight, 
and again, going back to labor laws and all that, you're not going to be able to go out to San Diego, make it back within the same day without violating additional laws. What this would do would, would be, if you're coming down from Humboldt, make a stop in Central California in your storage facility that's secured, uh, locked, wake up in the morning, and then go back on the road down to San Diego. Okay, any other comments? I have a couple of questions. Um, I'm concerned about having the distributor, who has the discretion to determine what variance requires a label? Is it 1% one day, 2% another day? You get three lab results, can you relabel to the highest result to get the most, you know, put the most product on the market that has the highest THC? Do you have to average it? So I have some concerns about that and concerns about secondary storage facilities ensuring that they have, uh, they do require dual licensing so the locals have to license the facility and that they maintain the same security and safety standards as a regular distribution facility. Uh, the second one, it would be no different than a transportation only license. The only difference is instead of transportation, you can actually hold inventory there without taking title to the property. Um, what was the first? Uh, who has the discretion on what variance requires a relabel? So on the variance, uh, we had, uh, in the subcommittee, we had agreed to a 10% uh, variance. Now, currently, the way it stands is if I was a distributor and I sent it out to a lab and the, uh, the test results came back um, negative. I can send it to a second lab, I can send it to a third lab, I can keep sending it to a bunch of different labs until there's a lab that actually passes the product. Uh, here the discretion to relabel it and by relabeling a fixed and additional uh, sticker on it would be at the discretion of whoever owns the, pro the product, which would be your manufacturer or your cultivator. Thank you. Let me just clarify that the lab testing, you would do your lab testing and then the product would either go to market it would go back for remediation if eligible or be destroyed if not eligible for remediation. You cannot go to multiple labs trying to get different responses. But this would allow you to put a sticker on top of it without having to go back and remedy. And so, uh, just, I'm, I apologize, a point of clarification. The relabeling would be for um, cannabinoid profile and contaminants? I, I thought we were just talking about cannabinoid profile. We're talking about whatever information would be on the mandatory third-party laboratory testing that would allow or authorize the product to be introduced into the supply chain. If it's something that can be remedied with a sticker on top of it, that would accurately reflect the testing results that do matter, which would be the third-party testing done by the distributor and the third-party lab. That's the, those are the results that would be masked with the additional label. Would I be able to request, uh, even though it's complicated, this recommendation be split uh, because I have, right now I could, I could support part of the recommendations, but not all of them, which would re result in a no vote, which might not be the result that people want. I'd like to hear additional committee comments, and if that is, uh, I'll consider it after the committee comments. What would lead a di distributor to decide to retest the product? The manufacturer, the cultivator, if there's a consensus, but the results would not matter, but as far as testing it, you can test it as many times as you want. The cultivator, the manufacturer can test it as part of their QA, QC program, but the final test results that would matter would be the test results that the distributor sends out to a third party lab prior to introducing into the supply chain. Prior to introducing to, to the dispensary and the consumer. For formal testing, you can do that once, and then at that point, if it fails, you could send it back for remediation. Um, to the manufacturer. Once it's allegedly remediated, you could then submit it to testing again with information about what was done to remediate that product. Um, but again, you can't just keep testing it. You can do quality control testing for your own purposes, but in terms of the actual state mandated testing, there's that one testing and those will be the results. And it wouldn't go back through that um, unless it's been remediated. And then the remediated product would be tested. Okay, saying no further comments, can we have a one, roll? I, one further comment. I have trouble with uh, having the extension of the temporary regulations be part of uh, this, uh, this motion. I think that deserves a full uh, conversation. On that comment, I would say that we're living it every day, and every day it's getting just as bad, and we're already March 15, halfway through March, we got two and a half months of transitional. 
it's fair to assume that not much is really going to change over the next two and a half months. And the transition I'd like to. Can I just ask a clarification? Is that is the recommendation in number four to extend the transition period for all temporary regulations for six months, or is it about the A and the M licenses? That wasn't actually clear to me. Um, the recommendation is for the transitional period to be extended. Yes, everything. Actually, the recommendation is listed is extend the transition period for six to months to 12 months to allow transactions between A and M licenses. Right. So it is limited to the, to the transactions between the A and M licenses? Yes. Okay, let's go ahead and take a vote. Babulian? Aye. Cermak? Aye. Clifford? Aye. Dombrowski? Aye. Farrow? Aye. Heidelback Terremoto? Aye. Harada? Aye. Huffman? Jacobson? Nevidal? Abstain. Nikita? Aye. Peck? Aye. Ron? Aye. Stevenson? Aye. Sweeney? Aye. Todd? Aye. Woolsey? Nay. Wu? Aye. You? Aye. All right. That Motion passes. Thank you. All right, Mr. Uh, one other item, Mr. Bobulian, do you want to pull the statutory changes uh, for discussion or are we good? No, we're good. The statutory changes were introduced uh, during the subcommittee and then we followed up with the regulatory one. It's pretty much the same thing. Okay, perfect. All right, well, uh, let's go ahead and take a quick break. It is now 1.15. Yeah. Why don't we go come back here at uh, 2 o'clock? At 2 o'clock. 